woke up at six, I was, woo, I was so wide awake. So I jogged, did my jog already today. Well, I run, I don't jog, I kind of run. <laughs> Cleaned my neighbor's gutters out. She had trees growing in there. She's a widow lady, so I get to love on her, and bless her. And she came over the other day, I was mowing her grass and she yelled over, she said, I'm growing trees. I looked up, oh, she is, she had trees. <laughs> the whole way across her spout, you know the seeds from the maple trees? They were all growing in there and I thought, so this morning I got the bright idea, I'm gonna go up the ladder and clean out her gutters. So I was so awake, I took my run already. I'm sorry I got here late, I, uh, cause I wanted to get here early actually and just mill around and fellowship cause I have to bolt out right after class today. I'm meeting somebody in York a little after 12.30 so. If you guys can just understand that after it's over, I'm just going to shoot right on out like a streak. But uh, I got here late. I wanted to get here early. My phone rang, and it was a very hurting young lady, and I decided to pick it up. So I had an eventful day already. If you're saved by works, I'm really saved. So. <laughs> I got a lot of things going on good today. So bless you, Adam. Good to see you, Pastor. You guys ready to roll? You ready to jump in it? We well, say we uh, receive the love of God a little bit and just thank Him for being so good and that we're all alive. Amen? You really are alive. Whether you feel like it or not, you're alive forever. You're never going to die. <laughs> Get that in your heart. Ask Holy Spirit to make that real. There's nothing to fear. Man, life is fun. Every challenge has the opportunity and privilege of manifesting Christ and leaving a legacy of faith and trust in Him. Think about it. Every trial... Every adversity you'll ever face carries the privilege of living by faith and leaving a legacy and glorifying Christ. Or it's just about you and you're in trouble and help me, Jesus. <laughs> and that's probably not too fun. Man, I'm so awake today. You guys are in trouble, man. I already put in like a whole day today already. I'm like pumped. <laughs> it's really good. Come on, serious, it's, 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 it's about Jesus, and we're going to look at that more, that your life's in Him, flows through Him, we sing songs that He's our everything, and that's because honestly, without Him, you'd have no idea the truth about your life. Jesus is the truth, the truth. He's the truth about life, the Father, you. Nothing was made that wasn't made through Him, He came to His own. Trouble is, His own knew Him not and received Him not. But he came to who? His own. Who's that? It's us. Yay. So, yeah, that is a high five. We're his own. So, he loves us. Father, we just love you. We thank you. This is true. Let revelation come to our hearts. Let your great grace manifest in us and through us. God, thank you. Come on, make contact with the Lord right now. You probably already did today. Whether you did or not, you can right now. Father, you love me. Thank you. Open up the eyes of my understanding. My heart calls me to see and know you more. I yield myself to you. The best I understand, the best I know how, I say my life is yours. The want to of my heart says yes to you. And I thank you that grace is sufficient. You're molding me. You're shaping me. You're changing my eyes. You're turning my heart. You're fashioning me in your image. And I thank you for your grace working in my life. I'm not troubleshooting. I'm not, I'm not fault finding. I'm not criticizing myself today. I'm thanking you. You're doing a work in me to manifest your son. You're glorifying your name through my life because you're building me on the inside in your kingdom and for your glory. And I I thank you for it. I rejoice. You are the one that is Lord of my life, Jesus, and I give myself to you. And it's important to pray like that and talk like that to the Lord. Father, we just love you and thank you today. We ask you for great grace on the word of God in our hearing, in our understanding. We know your word's alive and we ask that it would live in us vibrantly and produce great fruit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for everlasting life. Life is a privilege. Life is a privilege. Life is a gift. Thank you for life through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And sometimes you need to just say that about a thousand times till you believe it. Life's not challenging, a trial tough. Life is tough. Life is not tough. Life is a privilege. If your perspective is not clear, life is tough. You know, pastors, 
mother-in-law passed on she's 88 honestly there's physical loss but it's not tough because there's a gospel thank God what a time to be thankful and not grieve like those who have no hope this thing is so powerful come on the, the, the most we can lose is physical, tangible, temporal time with one another. That's the worst it could ever be. Oh. <laughs> and if you get serious, man, I'm just happy today. If you get a vision bigger than that, then nothing can eat your lunch. Oh my goodness. Makes you so free. Takes every target and every bullseye off of your life. The devil doesn't even have any cheap shot to take. Because if he touches you, he just makes a draw on Christ. If he touches you, he manifests Jesus. And it freaks him out if people would live this way. It would. It would freak him out. It would disarm him, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, man, the gospel. God, let us see and understand phone call this morning very hurting young lady not seeing and understanding and it'll devastate your life striving to fit in feeling less than trying to get people to notice her what a tragic way to live when God already sees and knows you and sent his son and made provision for himself to live inside of you you start there you camp there and you'll run well if you let everything else matter You'll never make a foundation here. Sometimes we put him two, three, four, five down on the list. We try to find a a mate and then bring Jesus in. (laughs) Bring Jesus in. Trust me. Colossians 2, we're going there today. That's where we left off. Isn't that amazing? We're going where we left off. This is going to be a miracle. Well, we haven't done it yet, but. (laughs) Isn't that funny, man? It is, isn't it? (laughs) Hey, I never did this. Let's do this because I got to calm down just a little anyway. Brent's from uh, Colorado, Denver area. Denver, Brent, uh, Brent is, so that's awesome. Came from Colorado. I, I know his pastor, been to the church. Yeah, welcome. There's, uh, there's a couple other people that are out of state, and we'll, you know, I want to recognize everybody, but there's some people out of state, and that just fascinates me that you're here from out of state. It's just humbling. That's why I had a lot of emotions on the first morning. It got me when I looked out at you guys and realized it doesn't matter if you're right here hometown. The fact that you're here really humbled me. But who's out of state? Let me know who you are so I know. Yeah, we got John from South Carolina. Stand up quick, just to holler out your name, where you're from. I, I need to know who you all are. Shana and Jonathan, South Carolina. Melanie, where you at? Ohio. Gee, bless you, man. Wow. Who else? Jump up if you're out of state. Just jump up. Florida. Awesome. Richard, Virginia, bless you, welcome. That's amazing. From Kansas. Hey, you're the name tag I picked up over there the other day. I said it on the chair. I was going to come up and find you, and it was already gone. Did you find it or something? I was sitting there, and I turned around to get it, and I went, where, what? I didn't even see you get it. I was like, I thought it got trans. I thought Jesus, I thought we were so spiritual that Jesus just put it on you or something. I was like, anybody else? Did we miss anybody out of state? Okay, welcome guys. That's amazing. Get to know these folks. I'm sure you already are loving on each other. It's all about loving one another. Amen. It's good to see you, man. Colossians 2, are you there? We're actually going here. This is good. Do you remember yesterday, Colossians 1, we talked about 
I said we want to go in the direction of having intimacy with God and communing with God. Uh, some people make comments to me lately. Holy Spirit's been really talking to me about giving more examples as I teach and opening up my heart and praying like I pray and personal communion. And some people have made comments in the last few months in my life where I've traveled that, boy, that's really helped me. I had a pastor, he's 13 years of pastoring, not saved, pastoring 13 years. He said, man, what I got out of this weekend is I finally know what it is to pray and commune with God and I'm learning how to pray pray and make because we're we've been taught to confess the word and the word's powerful and the word's anointed but you can confess the word and be very impersonal this way and you can reduce your relationship with God to a method you're trying to apply for your life to work and it keeps you self-conscious and it keeps you self-serving sometimes it keeps you self-motivated you're only doing it for your own sake it's not even taking you into intimacy with the Lord I mean, you can walk the floor all day and quote scriptures and it doesn't introduce you to the Father anymore. Do you follow what I'm saying? I'm touching some touchy ground on some stuff sometimes because we've been taught confession, confession, confession. And, and, and I love the Word of God. Man, you guys know I've been in the Word. It's just in me. It, but, but, but the way I do that is what, what we call a normal confession, I'll turn that into communion with God and I'll take what that's saying and what it means and I'll relate that to the Lord in prayer and talk and communicate. And I don't even, we call it prayer. It's just fellowshipping with the Lord. It's communion with the Lord. The, the Bible in several places talks about communion and fellowship with Holy Spirit. Philippians 2 and 2 Corinthians 13. Fellowship with, with Holy Spirit. That's communion, koinonia, interaction with the person of God. Man. So why do we put on a spiritual face, sound a certain way, and quote scripture in a certain tone? That's not, it doesn't change anything. No, Father, you really love me. Lord, I'm justified. Romans 5, 1 says you're ju- you have peace with God being justified by faith, right? Father, I thank you that I have peace with you. I thank you I've been so justified because you've sent Christ and Christ you've died and shed your blood. You took my guilt to make me innocent. You took my place. Thank you. You've made me a son. That's what that scripture means. And God, there's no war between us. Sin is destroyed and defeated. You've cursed sin in the flesh when you put it on your son and you made me free. I ask around, Christians don't pray that way. They don't even think that way so much. It's a good way to think. Better yet, it's a good way to talk and commune and express. Because with your heart you believe. Romans, right? Romans 10. With your heart you believe. With your mouth you make confession unto salvation. So we hear a scripture like that and turn it into a confession. No, what it means is out of my heart I'm going to express what I believe. I have peace with you, God. You're my father. I'm your boy. You love me unfailingly. You are not mad at me. I am not under pressure today. I'm privileged to be alive. You get it? That's communion with the Lord. You start living that way, He becomes so real to you, your heart comes alive. I can't explain it. Grace just breathes into your heart. When you release faith in, grace comes to make your reality. He's the one that illuminates you. He's the one that makes it real. And you get there by what we talked about yesterday. By what? Faith. Faith's going to take you there. Don't get stumbled with, yeah, but I don't feel, but it doesn't seem real. But when I get in alone with God, it doesn't seem like He's there. And then, so then you reduce God to a 30-day money-back guarantee thing or 60-day try-me-see-if-you-like-me thing. Faith isn't something we try. It's what we live. I talk to a lot of people. I really do. I counsel and minister and pray for and encourage and just fellowship with a lot of folks been privileged to do that and one of the comments I hear a lot is well well, Dan I've tried that but I've done that well yeah but I used to do that well I've said that and when you, when you hear that language you can hear that people are thinking in a mindset of methodology they're trying something to see if it works so they're, it's totally sensual driven you're going to try it and then look and see if it's working Try it, and then you're going to, after a while, pull out and get intellectual and assess and come up with another thing. You get what I'm saying here? Be very careful you don't live that way. 
very careful. You don't pray for something and then look. <laughs> you say, oh, it's not working. What do I do? Well, I tried what you said yesterday. Nothing seems to be happening. What's the next plan? What do we do now? <laughs> we're driven like that. And we're revealing to, to, especially spiritually to the enemy, that we're on the run and you're squeezing the life out of me. So keep squeezing. You get it? Man, wonder if we would respond spiritually in a way where he would stop squeezing because he's helping you. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> he's squeezing me. He's helping me. <laughs> he's, he's swarming Christ in me. I'm sitting on daddy's lap. He's squeezing me and I'm in fellowship with God and I'm receiving truth and I'm not looking at what he's doing. I'm looking at what he has done and I'm building in that because of the squeeze. I'm standing here like this and he's helping form Christ in me. There's things I knew. I, I was nine months saved. I told you yesterday that testimony. I had a fellowship with Holy Spirit that I don't believe I would have had in a nine-month period of time if it wasn't for the trial that was coming from hell. So was I a man with a problem? I'm a man with a covenant. The great answer in Jesus. Keep my eyes on him. Remember when I was telling you about those voices? Yak, 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 yak. And we think that's a deliverance issue. We think that's inside of me. Are you kidding? My heart was so sold out, so surrendered. I was so flipped out and freaked out for Jesus. People were weirded out by me. People were looking at me strange. My coworkers were he's in a cot. I'd, I'd mess with them and freak them out. They'd say, you're like you're brainwashed. And I'd say, my brain is so washed. <laughs> they were just serious. I would mess with people because I was changed and they knew it. Come on, I was only saved four days and didn't say one word about Jesus. And I had a co-worker come in the bathroom to ask on behalf of my whole crew what happened to me. Four days. What could they have seen in four days when I didn't say a word? Oh, I just was different. I was so sold out. And then these voices, three months goes by. Just three months of just... Ooh, ooh. Do you know what I mean? on the shores of spiritual bliss with Jesus just Jesus and me honeymooning away right for three months yay right and all of a sudden after three months of that wretched terrible phrases started going through my head that I didn't even think of or talk when I wasn't saved I mean I cursed pretty bad just to fit in but this was like nasty stuff and it the strength of it was directed to the person of Holy Spirit, which is weird. Well, it's not weird because there's scripture that says if you blaspheme him, you're cut off in your darkness. And, and, and Satan sees my hunger. He sees my purity. He, he starts whispering things. Starts just... It wasn't even my heart. It wasn't even my mind. It was yakety yak, yak, yak. And here's what we do. We take the yak yak personal, tag it to us, wear it as who we are, and go seek help, deliverance, and ministry. When my heart so does, I don't even want to think that stuff. That stuff is ridiculous. Well, then why is it in your head, brother? Because the devil's a jerk. <laughs> so here's, so I sit on my bed. I sit on my bed, and I cry pathetically. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I don't feel this way about you. I don't think anything like this about you. I, why do I think this stuff? I'm crying. He comforted me and lovingly whispered and said, Oh, I know you don't, Dan. And I'm like, but then why am I, what am I supposed to do? Right? He said, Dan, every time you hear that voice, tell me how you feel about me. Every time. Just tell me how you feel. And I went, oh, 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 I got it. Right? I was three months. I'm like, three months. Come on. I've got little spiritual huggies. I'm like, ah, three months. I can't know that much, but I know one thing. I'm sincere. I want God. I'm not cursing God. You'd be amazed how many people, after I had this experience and started sharing this testimony in my home group a lot, how many people would pull me aside and cry and believe that they had blasphemed because they had the same experience. 
And they were actually hanging around church hoping they were fitting in, hoping they were uh, uh, acceptable, but in their heart believed that they had committed some unpardonable sin. Probably over a dozen people have come to me and confided and said they were believing that when they heard my testimony. Actually believing it at the time I shared the testimony. But they were in church hoping they weren't cut off, but in their heart believing they were. How tragic is that? Well, see, that's why that thing came, because there's a scripture that says, if I speak against the Holy Spirit. So now all of a sudden, I'm chomping at the word. Three months old, I'm going to hit that scripture soon. And when I hit it, what's going to happen if I don't have understanding? (gasps) Sweaty palms. Why am I going to do all this? Because I care. Not because I'm retrobrate and and, and sold out for darkness and don't care. The reason I'm going to do that is because I care. Because I'm pure. So Satan's trying to abuse me in my purity for what I don't understand. And take advantage of my pure heart. And condemn me. So watch this. Here's the paradox. If you don't have a relationship mentality, but a confession sheet mentality, after a week, every time you hear that voice, you tell Holy Spirit how you feel, and you're still healing the voice. Guess what your mind says? Your intellect. Well, if I heard Holy Spirit, why am I still hearing this voice? I mean, I'm telling him how I feel every time I hear the voice. Why? And then we get caught back up with what? The voice. And the problem. Was I a man with a problem? I was a man with an answer. I was a man with fellowship with God. I was a man on his way to knowing him more. Do you get it? So a month goes by. Yak, yak, yak. And you still hear that voice. You know what we do? Well, if you heard God, brother, you, you know, that thing would have been submitted by now. You need that thing cast out of you. That's a devil, man. You need deliverance. And if that was, you know, and we get presumptuous. See, because we focus on problem. And we think everything has to be cookie cutter smooth with no trial, no trouble, glassy seas, calm winds. And that's when we're right in the spirit. you might have a third of a day like that (laughs) in your life (laughs) but I tell you what your heart can be calm and there could be calm winds and glassy seas inside of you see I started having so much fun with it because I started to realize the strategy I started to realize that God's given me the kingdom that he's put the authority and power of truth in Jesus' name and, and the finished work of Christ in me. And all I have to do is live by faith and respond to him with a pure heart and I'll see him. All I have to do is submit to God and resist the devil. He'll flee. I don't resist the devil. I submit to God. In submitting, I've resisted. It's a one-stepper. <laughs> and I don't get tired. I'm always refreshed because I'm not fighting him. I'm fighting the good fight of faith, maintaining a healthy identity in the face of adversity. Oh, this is so good. I hope you're listening. You recording this? This is good. (laughs) Are you getting this? Because here's what intellect says. Well, yeah, but Dan, come on now, a month. If that was God, that would be stopped by now. And we make that a problem it so had me inspired I'd go to work and out of the blue I'd hear this stupid phrase go through my mind and I I started to get so used to it and have so much fun with it it would just happen and I'd say Holy Spirit you're so amazing I love you with all my heart you are so my best friend you have changed my life forever you're revealing Christ to me you're showing me all things and teaching me all things and showing me all things to come you're amazing I would sit down the case I would stand in the aisle didn't care if anybody was around you are so my best friend you are so my best friend forever I love you with all my heart and I'd start working again and if I heard yak 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 right on the heels of that Holy Spirit you're amazing I just appreciate you revealing Christ to me. Thank you for winning my heart and winning my life. And I'd keep working. Was I a man with a problem because I'm hearing yak, yak, yak? I'm only a man with a problem if I focus on yak, yak, yak and start fighting yak, yak, yak and let yak, yak, yak become who I am. Oh. Do you see how powerful the gospel is designed? But you've got to live by faith. 
If I turn it into a method after a month, two months, three months, four months, I'm thinking something's wrong. I got to come up with another plan. This isn't working because I'm still hearing something I'd rather not hear. It got to the point where I could care less if I heard it or not because when I heard it, it spurred me to respond out of my heart and it actually taught me one of the most valuable lessons under a year old in the Lord of my life to never take personal what goes through my mind and think it's me. It's outside trying to get in. And if I grab a hold of it and take my identity through that, come on, who's ever had a flashback of the past? Who's ever remembered something you wish you never did? And then the church makes the big mistake and says, well, that's still lingering in you, buddy. That's still hiding in you. That still has a root in you. We need to minister to you and get that up and out of you. And when you submit to that, what you're saying is, that's still me. (laughs) I don't need deliverance. Well, maybe. (laughs) No. (laughs) I've been delivered. See, because the memory that comes to me that I wish I never did, the truth is I wish I never did it and I'd rather never have the memory. True? So is it coming up and out of you or is it coming to you? I'm probably, I, I promise you it's things that owned your life and had you like a puppet on a string that have lost control over your life and it slips back in looking for an opportune time and tries to get you to come back into agreement to accept that it's still you to fight a fight that's not even there. The fact that you care and are grieved and wish you didn't even think or see some or remember something yeah. is good evidence your heart's changed and you're a different person. That ought to be enough right there. <laughs> Come on. If you're feeling bad for what you were thinking, then you ought to rise up and say, Father, I so thank you. You have changed my life. I will never be the same. You've taken truly, taken the old and just thrown it away. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. Everything I ever was apart from you is done and gone through the Christ. And I am truly alive and transformed. You can pray that way right in the midst of a flashback. Watch this. If you do that every time a flashback comes, who knows that sooner or later it wouldn't be in the best interest for the enemy to bring a flashback because you're building yourself in truth and in Christ. And that's the true principle of submitting to God, resisting, he'll flee. It's so powerful. It is good. Man, that right there will save you from a whole lot of duress. If you don't handle it that way, guess what you do? You open your soulical, feeling, sensual life to the enemy even more, and then he'll just pummel all the more. Next thing you know, it's dreams at night. It's waking up with the same old fears before you knew Christ. The next thing you know, you wonder if you're even saved. And then you wonder why God's letting this happen. What did I do wrong? What door did I open? What? Maybe I wasn't serious in the first place. Maybe I need to get rebaptized. Maybe, and all of a sudden it's just question, 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 doubt, concern, second guessing. Who knows that's a place of torment? That's terrible. <laughs> Come on, you look inside your heart right now. Every person in this place, this is the grace of God. You look inside your heart right now. You know what's making you tick. And you know the why behind your life. Serious? don't sell that cheap and sell that out because of an impression a feeling a memory or a dream if you have the wickedest wickedest most grossest dream and you wake up and go uh, wake up and say father I so thank you that you have sanctified me through truth and you have shown me what truth is and God there was a time when I remembered something like that or had a dream like that I would have thought that it, but Father I love you worship you etc if you respond healthy and you don't make a big fuss over the dream I promise you the dream will go away you make a big fuss over the dream it says oh I got him on the ropes now I got him on the run man he's scrambling squirming making phone calls intercession on prayer lines <sighs> and you say well why would he be because none of that that you're doing is by faith you're scrambling you're just running scared. And you think, yeah, but everybody's praying for me. And I got, I'm on the prayer lines. Why does the dream keep coming back? Why isn't God protecting me? He already has because he told you who you really are through Christ. And it's time for you to believe that and stop believing all this. He's already answered you. John, we have a question. I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll repeat it out. Oh, a comment or something. Hang on, make, yeah, BJ, can you help me, buddy? He has a comment rather than a question. It's just for the video and the, 
precious people online. Go ahead. Well, man. for me, it's been similar uh, to your experience with, with the devil coming to you and speaking blasphemous things about the Holy Spirit. With me, for probably even still, uh, for the last six, seven months, I've been get the devil has come. I, I've it's been a growth thing for me because I have crazy dreams all the time where I'm not doing anything. The devil hasn't been able to get to me in the real life, so he'll get me to try to feel like my conscience is violated to where I'm actually doing things that I've been delivered from, doing drugs or things okay. like that. Yep. And, and that's been a huge growth thing for me too. I, I could allow it to violate my conscience and feel guilty because I'm actually really doing it in my dreams. So mm -hmm. when you wake up, you feel like you're doing it, but that same thing that you're talking about, just saying, waking up and knowing and being confident that's in right. who I am and just worshiping God for the truth about me Bingo. and that that's not me. Right you know? out of your heart. Right out. Do you hear what he's saying? Because a lot of people have a dream like that and they're actually doing it and it was a past former thing. They think that thing's buried in them somewhere and rooted in them and, and they say, oh my God, but that's in my subconscious or I wouldn't even have the dream. And we get real intellectual and psychological about it and we make it a major issue. What's so hard about jumping out of bed and going, whoa, I'm so glad that's not me. Never will be. That man is dead and I am changed forever. Yay, I'm pumped to be alive in you, Jesus. Ah! And the devil is going. <laughs> because he's used to us biting all that stuff and getting hooked over and over and over, hook, line, and sinker. I and mean, he's just used to throwing stuff out there and boom, we're done. You see what I mean? But here's the deal. There's a sanctifying. I, I, I had some major bad habits in my life before I got saved, just like you did. I had some mentalities that weren't good. I got into a little of that yesterday with motives, just with Kim and everything. And, and I used to, man, I was just, I was a guy without Jesus on the earth. Do you get it? So there was things that I commonly did in my mind and wandering. And after I get saved, those little blurbs would come back to me, those little things would come back to me and it would just make me rejoice inside because I didn't take it to heart as if it was me I realized it was it's it's kind of like habit stuff it's kind of like you give yourself to something it's going to keep knocking on the door if you close the door it's going to keep knocking on the door to see if you're home come on it's like a, it's like an addiction you get through an addiction that little impulse will come and whisper every once in a while and see if you're home that is not a problem unless you get freaked out by it and start taking it to the point where I still got issues. Oh my God, I got... That's why, that's why... Uh, oh God, video. God help me. Okay. That's why some of these programs say you're always going to be an addict. Because the impulse, the temptation, and the memory, they're letting identify the person. And they're saying, you always have the capacity to go back. And we're making the impulse who we are. <laughs> why, do we, why do we sell so cheap? <laughs> and just live psychological and intellectual. Come on. I was made a certain way to live a certain way. And Christ brought me back to that. And I ain't selling cheap. One of my biggest prayers with tears is, Lord, don't let me miss one drop of grace available through Jesus Christ to transform my life. Because we look at anatomy, human anatomy, we look at the male and the female, we look at psychological patterns, emotional patterns, and we say that's the way we are. No, that's the way we became through the fall. We're studying a fallen man, and it's not our created identity and value. It's not our redemption through Christ. <laughs> From, from testosterone to sexual desire to all kinds of stuff. We say, this is the way it is. That's wrong. That's deception. That's the way it became. We're looking at a man born in Adam, assessing him and identifying our lives. But now we're in Christ. We have a problem now. We're in Christ. <laughs> and see we think this is too spiritual or hypo spiritual or way out in outer space somewhere no there is redemption through Christ Jesus 
My body can come into alignment and agreement. Come on, you can sell yourself short. And you can say, I'm just not any younger, you know. Well, I'm getting older. You can talk yourself in to aging and pain and breakdown and degeneration because you accept it. Because there's a way that seems right. Because it's everybody's experience. It's going to be mine. And you sell out and you buy in. Don't do that. I'm not doing that. (laughs) Look, you can do it. It's your privilege. I'm saying don't do that. I want to know. I want to know who I am apart from ever eating that tree. Who Adam was going to be is who I am now. I want to know what that looks like. Oh, I want to know who that is. And that, see, see, here's the deal. We have expected to be a certain way. Well, it is that, well, you know how we are, brother. Well, we're always going to be, well, you know, well, God, you know. And then because of that, we've reduced this to just waiting to go to heaven. And trying to be pretty good here and do what we know is not right. Uh, what's right and not do what's not right. And one day we'll all be with Him. And we've, that's why we've sold out and reduced it to, go into, to just go into heaven. Because we don't see ourselves through redemption. We see ourselves through the flesh. My Bible tells me in Second Corinthians to never again judge any man according to the flesh. You... you I get things in the mail that tell me what I have to experience now because of the age group I'm in. You're mailing it to the wrong guy. I I promise you, you're mailing it to the wrong guy. My Bible says, eat any deadly thing, it won't harm you. That doesn't mean I find it's deadly and go eat it and test and tempt God. That means I never live in fear because the Spirit of God is upon me. That means if I ate something in ignorance, if I'm in 2011 and there's preservatives and I'm not aware of the long-term effects because they don't even have the knowledge and we've been eating it for 20 years, why do I freak out and fall apart when I read an article and let that natural knowledge eat my lunch when the Spirit of God, through His Word, tells me who I am? See, we don't live by faith. We live by natural knowledge and man's experience and then we try to incorporate God into that for help. And we have all the help we're ever going to (laughs) need. Are you hearing me? You better be hearing me. I'm yelling. (laughs) Because if you're not hearing me, we got to pray for your ears. (laughs) But I mean, are you hearing me? Come on. The average Christian mindset can read the new finding article. This preservative causes cancer. And you go, oh my God. 99% of cancer is found to come from this and you're and now your attention's had you have to read the article see I wouldn't even have to read the article and I'm not comparing me to you what I'm saying is we have to read the article because we're not sure settled and established and that thing has a voice see you can tell me all day who I am and who I'm not but I have the choice to listen to who I'm going to listen to I know who I am and who I'm not so you can't change that now you're too late (laughs) way too late I'm telling you when I turned 40 I got stuff in the mail you are now over 40 I'm like whoa (laughs) 40 what is 40 in the kingdom exactly They're saying 40 in the world. I'm in the world and not of it. That is not a spiritual cliche, a religious cliche that we say on Sunday and clap to and don't believe on Monday. I'm in the world and not of it. I've been sanctified out of the darkness into the light, partook of His divine nature, escaped the world that's corrupt through lust. I am a man of God in the Spirit. Hello? So my life doesn't come under the same definition. Is that haughty, presumptuous, high-minded, proud? It's the Word of God. I humbly wear that. I don't walk with a sandwich sign. I'm untouchable, invincible. I'm not like you. I just live this thing with a pure heart. I accept this. It's called the finished work of Christ. I can honestly tell you that it's possible to live without an ounce, a speck, a jump of fear for the rest of your life in Christ. 
And I'm either in denial, deceived, and need ministry and somebody to jerk me out of deception right now. Or the gospel's taught me how to never fear again. And I believe time will prove me right that that I, I don't even know how to fear anymore. Because my eye sees so different than it used to. When you don't see for yourself, you can't fear. Oh, you can be concerned for the well-being of people. You can be concerned for simple things. Allows you to pick up the phone at 8.30 with a towel wrapped around you and you're not even dressed and I have all you here at 9. Pick up a phone to a broken-hearted little girl. Because I'm not thinking, oh, I can't take, oh my God. What I got? I'm not under that. I'm not thinking that far ahead. I'm not under that kind of pressure. Oh my God, she's calling now. I'm not even dressed. We've got school. Oh, honey, not now. (laughs) Hey, it's going to work out. You're just going to pick up the phone. She's a hurting girl. Jesus is bigger than all these other things. You just pick up the phone. You're not stressed. You're not taxed. You're not, here we go again. Why not? God, where's your grace today? If I was under grace, she wouldn't be calling now. Come on. That's intellect. That's the way that seems right to men. That's human reasoning. That's human worldly wisdom that sells grace short, subverts faith. Come on, the average Christian hears 99% cancers come from this preservative. You start reading the article and it says this preservative is named right? It's a big long thing and you go, what is that? And it says it is found in this, 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 this and the list is this long. And you go, oh my God, you have ingested two-thirds of the things on that list for the last 30 years of your life. Now what's the average Christian do? Oh my God. God, and they start praying over their body, touching and sanctifying and praying for cleansing and washing. Why? Because when they start praying, it's fear-driven. They're actually saying, I'm vulnerable to this. Please help me. Fear is a subtle... All of a sudden, natural knowledge is what's stimulating your prayer and you're concerned. It's not faith, you're concerned. So you're in a prayer line on Sunday and you're at the altar and they say, how can we pray for you? Well, uh, well, I mean, I'm believing God. I mean, I know God's hands on my life. But I just read this article and it said about this and that. And I, it's just like, I just want you to pray and just, just, you know, and praise God. I know He's for me. But just to be sure that, you know, that I'm just free from any effects of this. That's a common thing I've been at prayer lines long enough and heard enough requests somebody heard something through the week read something through the week was on the internet and saw something through the week and now they're asking for prayer just in case what is that? that's vulnerability that's a form of fear we as Christians feel like we're vulnerable to the environment in which we live Instead of under the covenant hand of Almighty God, the strong tower, the refuge, who I run to and cling. (laughs) It's a fearless place. It's not presumptuous and proud. It makes you feel, like right now, you ought to be inside. I feel like, because I know what I'm saying is true. Because I know how I live. I don't fear stuff. I don't fear contagious stuff. I don't, I, I give blood at the, they used to ask you questions. They'd say, have you been in contact with anybody with hepatitis? I said, are you kidding? I get my hands on those people as much as I can. <laughs> and they go, what? I said, man, if, I, if it's HIV, if it's hepatitis, I'm right there. They're like, what are you, what are you talking about? I said, well, I just had my hands on somebody with hepatitis just the other day. What? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and then I, get a, I get a call from the Red Cross years ago. I'd shared this testimony. You've heard this probably. They, they tell me that I don't have positive for this, 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 and this in my blood. And that that's unheard of. That everybody has positive for this, 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 and this in their blood. And they're just amazed that I'm negative, 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 negative. How can that be? And I said, well, why are you making a big deal with this? What's that mean? I mean, I don't think I should be positive for stuff. What? She said, well, it doesn't keep you from donating. It just means you're in environment. You're exposed to environment in the world. She said, when you look at your readings, it's almost like you're in the world, but you're just not even living in it. It's like you're here, but you're not. I said, I can explain everything. 
Now see, that's not something I'm believing for in my bedroom. Father, I thank you that the things of the environment aren't contaminating my body and my blood is clean and I am pure and I thank you, Father, that I am going outside and I'm breathing the air and all the monoxins and carbon monoxins and all the stuff and all the whatevers and they're not going to affect me. <laughs> the only reason you're doing that is because you believe they can. <laughs> and you call that prayer. And when they find something, you say, I don't know why, and I can't believe it, how come, and I prayed for 20 years that this couldn't touch me, and it did touch me. The only reason you prayed for 20 years is because you believe it could. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, we're in the nitty. See, we didn't even do Colossians. I knew it. <laughs> Man, this is school. <laughs> are you guys all right? <laughs> There is tomorrow, isn't it? Brent, you are an encourager, dude. Thank you. <laughs> there is tomorrow. Are you getting something out of this right now, though? Come on. Vulnerability. I woke up almost a year ago on my bed, opened my eyes, and the Lord of the universe over me, on me, spoke to me. My people feel vulnerable to the world they live in. And... And his heart crying. It was amazing. That's why there's passion in me. That's why. Because I have those experiences. God's coming. My people feel vulnerable to the world. And I'm like, he wants to address that. This is deception. This is. So see that you, you read that and all the stuff. And you read an article of all the stuff that's in the air. And you think about that. And it gets in you. And you get around. And now you're following a big truck. And now, now you're hitting the, the thing on the fresh, getting the fresh air turned off quick because you smell a little. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh my God, this stuff. And now you're praying and sanctifying the car and praying in tongues. <laughs> you know why you do that? Because you believe you're in trouble. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Man, let your heart rejoice with thankfulness that Christ has died and rose again and that you have believed by faith and grace is overtaking your life and you're in covenant. You don't have to even go to that extreme. I don't. I just, I'm thankful. Man, when stuff like that happens, I'm like, oh, thank you for the gospel. The lady calls me and tells me I'm negative for all these things. She said, everybody's positive. This lady, I don't know how true she was, but this is the only lady I talked to. She said, I said, well, so what are you telling me? She said, I'm telling you, your blood's purer than 99.9% .9 of the human population. And I said, I believe that. <laughs> no, I didn't try to believe that. I didn't go for that. In prayer. Being cynical a little bit for a reason. I want you to not have the ability to, ah, because of vulnerability. And if you realize after this day, vulnerability, you'll shift gears and you'll pull out of fear and into faith. Father, thank you. When I read that, it tried to grab me. But you know what? You've already grabbed me and held me tight. I am in the world and not of it. I don't even have to pray about this. It's already finished. Thanks for your love. See, that's faith. Man, that feels good to me. You get it? Oh, my goodness. I could tell you a lot of stories about stuff like that. I really could. I really could. Come on. How are you going to get near people that need Jesus? How are you going to get near? How would Jesus ever go and pray for the leper? That leper broke every rule of culture to even be out there on that street. He's got nothing to lose, man. He's tucked away. He is quarantined. And he says, whatever. I believe he's the Christ. He's breaking every cultural rule, law, code. He's not being a good boy in culture, society's eyes right now by being out on that street. He's breaking laws. And he, I love, do you ever watch like the Matthew videos? He, he, he comes up to Jesus. He's the leper. He comes up and he, he says, he says, Jesus, he puts his... Have mercy on me. He turns real humble like that. Jesus is looking. He's like. He says. If you're willing. You can make me clean. Right. And Jesus goes. And he's like he's going to cry. 
Oh, and he walks up, and all his disciples are going, and they got their things over their face, and they're turning, because they're like, oh my God, that's in the air, right? Jesus, Jesus is so amazing. He is like, super, Jesus is amazing. (laughs) He's our hero, he's everything. Jesus is amazing. You're so in love with him. He, He comes up, right? And he gets down. And he, and he takes off his little, his little blanket that he's covering his face with. And he goes, I am willing. Be clean. And everything leaves him. And he goes, oh, and he's running around there hugging and rolling. And I'm thinking, yay. But come on. We'd be like, we'd be like anointing the end of a pole and touching him or something. What would we do? <laughs> Can I tell you like, can I tell you a crazy spiritual story? It's, it was, I wasn't saved very long when this happened. It's some of the stuff that you, I have to tell some of these stories so you know what's wrong with me. Because, <laughs> serious, because it's not my fault. <laughs> serious, like, like, like you, you know, somebody cynical could sit back and say, oh, brother, what? But see, I live with me. I know how I live. I know there's no fear in my heart. I know, st- I know that when a deer tick was on me with a red ring, and I'm not telling you to ever do this. If you have fear, go, go get the treatments. Don't be a knothead. Go get the treatments. Now's not the time to find faith. Is you're not condemned. Go get the treatments and thank God He's growing you. And thank God that you're going to be okay. And thank God you're going to fulfill His will. Don't get caught in. Well, I don't know. I should be able to believe. And you're already, oh my God, waiting for the first symptom. You know, it's, it's not a mistake that I read. I, I, I'm in my dental office getting a teeth cleaning, and, and there's an article there, uh, 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 bullseye, big black, you know how they write stuff to get your eye. Bullseye, exclamation points, like three of them. You've just been hit. More exclamation points. And I'm like, whoa. And I look, here's the person's skin, deer tick, red dot, and a big ring around it. Looked like a target that people shoot at. And I started to read the article a little bit. And it said, this is the sign of an infected with Lyme disease, deer tick. If you have this on your body, get help immediately. Da, 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 da. You've just been infected. Da, 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 da. Who knows, Lyme disease is like a pandemic. It's like amazing and it's hurting a lot of folks. Isn't it amazing that two weeks after putting that into my knowledge, I got the thing on my belly and it looks just like the picture. Now that is just too funny. <laughs> See, to a guy like me, that's hilarious because that timing is too ridiculous. That's like, oh my goodness, you're kidding me. It's like, click. And you don't even pray. <gasps> you don't even kill the little tick. You got two little kids in the house. You don't even kill the tick. Why? Because the kids come under the authority, headship. They're, they're under me. My kids, by the way, until they got teens, and I had a wrong belief then. I thought they had to have faith growing up. I was kind of taught that. My kids never missed a day of school because they were under my authority. And, and they, they just were blessed. And it wasn't until they got in their mid-teens and then I thought they had to stand for their own life. And I kind of left them kind of hang out there a little to grow and <laughs> kick them out of the nest and I, was, I thought they had to have their own faith I didn't realize that I'm their daddy <laughs> you get what I'm saying some wrong believing then so then but up until that point one time I got a call that my son was feeling bad in school and I went to pick him up and I thought you know I'm just going to take him home and I loved on him he was really had a high fever I just held him on the chair and Spirit of God came on us, knocked us out, literally. We were just out. It was an amazing time. He's this little guy, kindergarten. He opens his eyes. I open my eyes about the same time. He's totally clear. Everything's fine. And Jesus is there. And we just play a little CD and worship Jesus together. He's just a little guy. Uh, yeah, it was just amazing. But I've seen a lot of stuff over the years. It's not an accident this thing's here. It's trying to draw on my conscious mind, my, my no, the knowledge that's been sown is now here. So I, the reason I didn't kill the little thing is because it's not a threat to us. So I flicked it in our head, just go have a good little life. Go 
get on something. <laughs> See, that's against our thinking. That's like, well, brother, you got to use wisdom. Whose wisdom? Your fear or God's word? See, if you're not in a place to do that, we're not compared and judged and condemned. Man, you're not judged if you go get the treatments. You're not non-spiritual. You're just in a growing process and let God keep fathering you and stay in the race. But at the same time, leave me alone if I'm okay. Do you get what I'm saying? You don't fight over this. If some esteem one day different than the rest and others esteem every day the same, it's the law of love, Romans 14. Don't compel each other to change and try to hook up just so they have to believe what you believe. Hey, if they're okay believing one day's different than the rest, don't you try to say, look, you got to get free in Christ, brother. We got more liberty. Every day's the same. He took us out from under that yoke and bondage. You need to get real, brother. You're religious. Because the Bible says if they honor that day under the Lord and it's by faith, then under the Lord they honor that day and God sees them and makes them stand. And if you don't honor that day, then under the Lord you do that and do it by faith and you see every day the same. It's the same to God is what that chapter is saying. And we're through natural knowledge in pride compelling each other just to believe what we believe as if our way is better. And what he's saying is faith is what's better. You get it? It's the law of love. It says in that chapter, some people only eat meat or vegetables being weaker in the faith. That doesn't mean a vegetarian's weaker. He, he's, he's saying in their culture, all the meat was sacrificed in their markets. A lot of the meat was sacrificed to gods and idols. So the Christians would go to the meat market and they didn't know where the meat just came from. <laughs> right? So they're sacrificing this stuff to all these foreign gods, you know, and, 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 and slicing it all up and dicing it and burning it and all this. And then they take the salvageable meat into the market to sell it to the people. And the people were like, I ain't putting that in my mouth. I don't know where that came from and who that was presented to. And Paul's writing saying that if you only eat vegetables because of the source and the, and the history of the meat, it's because you're weak in faith. If you're not eating that meat because of where it came from, you're not understanding Christ that all things are sanctified when received with thanksgiving and Christ changes everything. Doesn't matter if they sacrifice that thing to Dagon or whoever in the morning. You're eating it in the afternoon and you're in Christ and you thank God for the blessing and provision and you just eat the meat. That's what Paul's saying because Christ changes everything. That's simple. He says, but if you can't do that, the people that have the ability to eat the meat don't look down on the people that haven't grown to that place and won't accept that and don't want nothing to do with that meat. It says you need to honor one another, love one another. And it says if my eating causes you to stumble, I have now stepped out of the law of love and I'm the one in sin. Well, so it's all about cultivating faith, not bashing one another with our faith. Right? So I tell people straight up, I've gotten a little criticized by a couple people over the years for telling you if you have a little fear in you, now's not the time to try to find faith, just go to the emergency room. But don't let go of faith on the drive. And thank God He's with you and He's protecting you and He'll keep you. But in your heart at some point, keep on growing to a place where all of a sudden when crisis hits, all of a sudden one day you just see, hey, everything's fine. Man, this is fine. See, because that's where I'm at. When I'm doing this and flicking Him in the hedges, I'm not hoping and taking a stand hoping this works. It's what I see. I can't see anything else at that point. I related the article and the timing to, oh my goodness, this is funny. And I never prayed and never thought about it. And I'm fine. I'm going to remain fine. That's arrogant. No, it isn't. Just don't have fear. You follow me? It's just fun, man. See, because I know how we react when we read that article and two weeks later we have the same experience. I know how we react when Brother Bob has that experience and now we see how he went and what went with him and now that same thing starts happening to us. We relate to him and what he went through instead of this. We do that stuff all the time. It's called natural knowledge. I don't know how I got on all this. You guys all right? You're not vulnerable to the world you live in. Rick, do you have a question? Comment. Hang on. Let, let BJ get down here with the, the mic. 
just because of the tape. There's a scripture that is so shouting everything that you were saying from the, from the get-go. Okay. And it, it may seem a little weird, but it, it, it's so awesome. And the scripture is, it's appointed on the man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Because I'm dead to sin, I died. I'm never going to die again. But people fear judgment. They are, they're afraid that when they get to heaven, God's going to expose all the bad things they did. And they don't realize, most believers, that they're already judged righteous and holy. And when you're judged righteous and holy, you don't fear when you see all this stuff. I mean, if, if I'm going to die, I'm present with the Lord. That's a good day. That's true. Really if good. I'm going to live, it's still a good day. <laughs> I think that's really good, Rick. That's really clear. Go to First John 4 real quick with me. That's good. Thank you. You see, that's because we're, re- we're about ready to talk about identity and righteousness. And look what my heart's exploding in before we get there to Colossians. I'm saying all this. Why? Because these, the, we're kind of sharing the fruit and the, the, the benefit of living by faith and understanding love. Because who would agree with what Rick said that it's not an overstatement? Most Christians in, 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 at large, in, and I'm not just, it's not a, a rigid thing I'm saying. What I'm saying is the average Christian mindset is still very moved by death, right? Is that fair to say? Very moved by death. We see death as a finality. We see death as a fearful thing. We see death as an, oh my God. Okay? And, and, uh, and judgment, condemnation, judgment, the fear, the sense that I've done wrong, that I haven't measured up, right? Fear of judgment. And so judgment and death, that goes hand in hand. The fear of judgment and death and fear of death go hand in hand. Uh, I prayed for a man that was way up in his 80s and, 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 and it was an awesome experience. I don't have time to get into it. It's it it one of the most incredible spiritual experiences I've ever had, actually. And uh, I beat my steering wheel for a mile down the road screaming the name of Jesus. And, uh, but the man was in a coma on life support with his mouth taped and I could hear his heart talking to me. And I had a conversation with him and he talked back to me and his eye came alive and teared and it was gray and they, yeah, it was just amazing. But two weeks later he passed on and I asked the Lord, why? because I asked him to, about getting right with God and he said, it's too late for me. I heard that in my heart, it's too late for me. I can't just jump from one ship to another now when I willfully held on all this time. That wouldn't be sincere. I can't just pray the prayer and expect God to make things right. That's what he was saying. His whole family's sitting in the living room and I start talking to him and repeating what I hear him saying and they know that that's his language before he went into the coma because they're all trying to get him saved. And when they heard me repeating and saying all this, they fell, it was pandemonium, they fell on the floors wailing and crying because they realized how supernatural it was that I was hearing the thoughts of his heart in my spirit led him to Jesus he got saved he repeated and prayed with me and two weeks later he died I asked Holy Spirit it's a phenomenal amazing thing it makes you think he said Holy Spirit why two weeks why didn't he just go be with you? He's up in his 80s. It just seemed like he was just going to go. I, didn't, I was so overwhelmed by the experience. I never even prayed for him to be healed. So, you know, I was just like. <laughs> I got out of the house. I was like. Holy Spirit said, Dan. Watch what he said. It took me two weeks. To comfort. Affirm and convince his heart. That everything was okay. And get fear out of his soul that I really could love him this way, that he could really jump on board and that he was accepted open-armed and without question. It took me two weeks to convince him inside that he was truly saved and accepted in the beloved. And it was like when that fear was dispelled, he had the ability, fear was holding on. And when that fear was dispelled, he had the ability to let go and be with Jesus. It's mind-boggling. <laughs> <laughs> Got to tell you some of these stories. You'll see why I'm so pumped up. <laughs> Knowing him's enough, but when he starts manifesting stuff like that and showing himself like that in people's lives, it gets really fun. Amen. Did I turn you to First John four? 
Yeah, this is Rick's fault. So, so if this isn't God, no. <laughs> Fun. Okay, love, love, verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Not fear of condemnation and torment. We have boldness in the day of judgment. Okay, we have boldness. So love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. He is love, we've become love. He's a son, we've become a son. He's anointed by God, right? Jesus of Nazareth, anointed by God, went around doing good, etc., etc. He modeled life we're created to live. He's the firstborn among many. We've been anointed. Our cups are running over. All these things, you could could go on and on and on. The resurrection, the the, the power of God through Christ, all those things, seated at the right hand. Uh, Behold, I give you power, tread upon serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, the authority of his name. All that stuff fits there. As he is, so are we. The main thing he's talking about in this whole chapter is becoming love and love has been perfected among us in this here's the sign of perfected love when you have boldness in the day of judgment why because his heart's become your heart his ways become your way you've become one with him and you've totally accepted the identity he's granted you through Christ and you're not ashamed do you get it the message version version. okay at verse start in verse 17 8 This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. Verse 18 says, there is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Oh, Ooh, I know how to work this. <laughs> Since fear, that had to be the Holy Ghost. He said, take your thumb and just slide it up the screen. I think I've seen somebody do that once. Since fear, <laughs> I am such a caveman. You have no idea. I don't even want a cell phone. I'm wondering, it's wonder I'm holding one. This is a cell phone. I'm thinking it's got a ring. <laughs> Since, since I, I'm getting over this, God's building something in me. Cell phone, cell phone. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. That's amazing. Watch. New King James, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Man. But he who fears has not been made complete in love. Is it possible for the gospel to cause you to live completely without fear? Is it? Is that what this is suggesting? And declaring? Yay. So how important is it to understand God's view of you through the Son of God, to understand you've been made righteous, to understand that it's not anything you're doing, it's what He has already done. Yesterday's verse in Colossians, you are holy, blameless, and above reproach right now, if indeed you continue today in the faith. What can change that but you failing to agree and believe? looking in the mirror and reassessing or falsely assessing your life. Taking yesterday's identity on. Yesterday's regret. Even a slip in the flesh or a moment of weakness, taking that so personal that now you weigh yourself through your actions instead of go grab a hold of his and let strength come back into your life and be matured, wiser, smarter, and sharper, and sanctified from that moment of weakness. Did you catch what I just said? Because what we do is, yeah, but brother, if I was God, I wouldn't be, yeah, but why, but yeah. And we exploit this and make this huge. You need to make the gospel huge and the finish with Christ so huge that it trumps everything and takes you to the finish line. Okay? Let's go back to Colossians 2. I'm ready to go there now. I am really ready. No, I am ready. Whoever expressed that doubt and unbelief, <laughs> you can repent when I get there. 
<laughs> I heard that sure. <laughs> Man, I have scarred you guys. We're at school and I have marked you already. Oh my. Thanks, Jesus. You're so good. Mm-mm-mm. Let's look at verse... Well, let's just read Colossians 2. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Do you see what this man's intense about? That people's eyes would see it and they'd understand what this thing is really all about and what it really means and who you are because of it. Do you hear that? This thing is so much more than praying a prayer to go to heaven and trying to stay plugged into a local church. <laughs> man, thank God for the local church. and Man, stay plugged in and, and all that. This thing is amazing. Look what he said. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. But see, when I read stuff like that, that's how I commune with God. Father, I thank you. You're illuminating me to the full assurance of understanding there's great riches in it. I treasure it more than life itself, more than anything, because without it, I'll never live my life the way you designed and created me. God, I yield and I'll slip to my knees when nobody's looking. Father, I thank you. You illuminate my understanding. You've transformed my life and my world and you've brought me into yours. Thank you that I was always with you and always one with you from the beginning. I thank you for knowing me and allowing me to begin to know you. I'll pray like that when I read something like that. I'll just stop and go, whoa. So this isn't just Bible knowledge and I can quote it and I can say amen when the preacher preaches it because I think, hey, I just read that this week. <laughs> Are you following me? I'm not being rude. I'm being real. Knowledge will puff you up. Love edifies. And it'll take, we just learned the fear out of your life. Okay, the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all, oh my goodness. How many treasures? So why look anywhere else? Do you see how a matter of fact the gospel is? Come on, do you see how straight and narrow it is? In whom are hidden all the treasures of true wisdom and knowledge. Right? All the treasures in whom the Father and the, and, and the Son. Now this I say, least anyone should deceive you with any other words, persuasive words. Like, yeah, but, yeah, but you got to, well, but you got to face reality. But yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. And the list goes on. He said, this I'm saying so that you don't follow any other language. You see why I preach as adamant as I do? Straight and narrow? Sounds like Jesus did. I mean, he said like amazing stuff, like you either gather to me or you're scattered either for me or you're against me. Why? That doesn't mean you're evil and wicked. It means either your mindset can complement, add to and enhance the kingdom or it's contrary to the very kingdom that you're a part of. Think about it. Your mindset leads to then your productivity. Right? You start getting wrong thinking, it starts breathing wrong believing, that starts breathing and breathing wrong speaking, that produces wrong fruit. But yet, you're sincere and see your need for a savior and you honor him as Christ, and yet you're living counterproductive to the kingdom you're called to. When he's saying you're either for me or against me, gather to me or scatter, he's not saying you're either wicked or you're a saint. If you really look at it, I mean, he can be saying that. It could mean that, of course. But you can be, you can see your need for Savior and be faithful servant in your church and have a mindset that lives contrary to the kingdom and the productivity of it. Do you get it? You just let fear rule your life. You just let negativity rule your life. You just let condemnation eat your lunch every day. And there's Jesus looking at you, loving you, knowing who you really are. You get it? Guilt, condemnation, shame. I cover it all the time. And I'll say it a whole bunch of times in this school. Is never, ever, ever, ever God. 
I don't care how guilty you seem. I don't be, you holding yourself guilty isn't going to change your life. Taking accountability, getting responsible for your actions is a good thing. But to just let guilt shroud over you and let condemnation and shame hover over you. No, once you take ownership, once you recognize something is not God, you deal with that. You take responsibility. You take it to God and see it for what it is. And then acknowledge that you're called to something else. This is not who you are. You have called me for higher things. I thank you for the light that you shows me the difference and this is where I belong you get it because guilt condemnation shame three major 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 tools of the devil because they produce regret and regret produces death guilt condemnation and shame when you label yourself through one of those there's no place for repentance and change because you're marked damned and doomed true and what are you waiting for to change? What's going to change that? You've judged yourself apart from Christ. Guilt says I'm not forgiven. Condemnation says my life is worthy to be judged. Shame says it's still who I am. You got it? Every one of those definitions is anti-gospel and anti-Christ. Are you guilty through Christ? Are you condemned through Christ? Are you ashamed through Christ? <laughs> then they can never be God. Because the kingdom is totally opposite. There is no condemnation in Christ. You're not living according to the flesh. That means your own works, ingenuity, identifying yourself through the flesh. It doesn't mean, you know, I'm not condemned as long as I don't live in gross, willful sin. That's not what that means. It means by my own strength, ingenuity, and creating my own identity. There's no condemnation through Christ for those who live by the Spirit, that means the grace that flows through the Son of God. Through truth and not according to the flesh. You trying to make your own way fit, work and measure up. Right? Yeah, guilt, guilt says I'm not forgiven. Condemnation says my life's worthy to be judged. And shame says it's still who I am. Yes, Martha. Here, she, he's getting you in the mic. I saw it before you did that. Huh? I saw it before you did that time. <laughs> hey, you were all on it, man. Um, I'm hoping this is the right place to ask this question, but it says, with the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. What is sin? In the flesh. Well, that's what I was, I was actually going to quote those scriptures right there that you just did. So that's awesome. You brought them up. You, you guys want a quick jump to Romans 8? Because that's where we're at. Just so you can see it in front of you. I quote it all the time that God cursed sin in the flesh and sin shall have no dominion over us. We're under grace. We're not under the law. Shall we go ahead and sin because we're under grace and not the law? Well, of course not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? You understand? So here's the deal. We're dying to a sin consciousness, a sin identity. You're not created for sin. You're created for His glory, for righteousness. You're not marked, stained, identified by sins that you've ever committed or the nature of sin any longer. God cursed sin in the flesh. So He took our sin and put it in His body on a tree. Anything hanging on a tree or a pole has been what? Did he curse his son or did he make him who knew no sin to be sin? What did he curse on the cross? His son or sin? He made him to be sin, therefore cursing what was killing us. So now the law of the spirit of life that flows through Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. If we'll live by the spirit, that means the grace that flows through truth and not according to the flesh weighing yourself a book by its cover face value past value you get it corinthians even says that because one died all died and if we live because one died then we ought to no longer live for ourselves but the one that died and therefore because of this we no longer judge any man according to the flesh why because we see every man now for his potential everyone's worth the blood of the son of God God has cursed sin in the flesh he doesn't judge you for sin he's killed sin on the cross what was killing us has been cursed and now we receive the blessing originally promised through Abraham you get it? <laughs> yay 
So, so the wrath of God was subsided, fulfilled. In, in other words, when Christ was made to be sin, the innocent for the guilty, one son for many sons. So you have to see the good news in this. He did not die to expose that you're sinners. He died to remove sins to expose that you're sons. Most of our lives, we've heard he had to die on the cross because we're sinners. He had to die because we sinned, but he didn't die because we're sinners. He died because we're lost sons. Who's preaching that? Holy Spirit had to tell me that in a bedroom because I was so condemned and beat down in sin conscious. And I want to give my life to God, but I can't live for God. Right? Because I'll just mess up again. But all of a sudden, I see and realize, wait a minute. He didn't die because I'm an accident waiting to happen. He died because I was never created for sin. I wasn't born to be a sinner. I was born to be a son. So he had to die to get me back to sonship, to redeem me. All of a sudden, I realize nobody pays a high price for nothing. I'm somebody to God. (sighs) Yay. And then we still let other things evaluate us and other things measure us. We still let past practice and people's impressions and what they say and don't say determine us. That, that precious young lady on the phone today, letting the world define her. <sighs> what a tragedy. Under the pressure of the world to measure up, to fit in. Wanting a certain job to be a certain thing in people's eyes. Wanting a certain this to... <laughs> Rat race. <laughs> it's a rat race. <laughs> I said, Pastor in West Virginia made me really laugh. He said, Do you know the bad thing about a rat race? You can win and you're still a rat. <laughs> I thought, Oh my gosh. <laughs> Even if you win, even if you think you're winning and you're getting over on life, <laughs> you're still a rat. <laughs> I don't want to be in a race with rats. <laughs> this is school, bud. I hope you, I hope you come back, man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was just funny to me. I thought, you know, he's right. I, I want transformed. I don't want wrong motives. I don't want to reach the top. I don't want notoriety and popularity and I don't need people to think I'm somebody. I am somebody to God. Christ died for me. And whether you see that or understand that or appreciate that or edify that or speak into that, what does that have anything to do with the truth that he died for me? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I want to get so along with you. I want to be able to love you and be loved by you. But whether that happens or not, or whether you see, appreciate, or even want Jesus, how does that change that he loves me? (laughs) Oh my goodness. There's no such thing as a bad day after that. When you get that revelation, you're, you're sealed. It's over for you in a good way. Yeah. It just is. Because instead of being broken, you break. Instead of being hurt, you hurt. Do you get it? Instead of hurting because of people, you hurt for people. It changes everything. Because the first way, it's just all about you. And that is a lethal trap. But the conversion and transformation is it's all about him and others. And you get the great privilege of being like him by the Spirit of God. And you get to participate in love. And the only thing it will cost you is what you gain through the fall. Self. Let him or her die already. And don't raise them from the dead. If you'd hear how many times I prayed that, I don't even pray it anymore. That guy's dead. But I used to just, just to be sure, right? You know how we are. No, it was a declaration to me because it just did something to me. 
I would say, Father, I thank you that old man is so dead. He is buried so deep. He can never rise again. You have made a brand new man. And then I'd leap and skip in my bedroom and just get really flighty and flaky. And I would say stuff like this. Never again will I be ruled by anger. Stress has no place in me. Strife has nothing to do with who I am. Father, never again will I be bound by the dictates of flesh. Because none of those things are what you made me to be. You made me to be like you. I was praying that stuff a month old in the Lord. Like radically running around my bed shouting and screaming. Because I was so aware that I could change. And I want to change. Serious. My mother-in-law came over one day to drop something off and heard me up there screaming and yelling. She thought I backslid and was screaming at Kim and the kids. She thought I was yelling and arguing. And she got so... And she started to sneak to her car to get away because she didn't want the confrontation and be in the middle of nothing. And I was screaming and yelling. And she got to the car and heard me saying, I love you, Jesus. You've changed my life forever. I just... ba 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 ba. And she started listening. It overwhelmed and touched her heart to hear the content of what I was saying. And then she looked and realized... She got so shook up. She realized Kim's car is not even there. Nobody's even home. And then she thought, oh my gosh, he's the only one in the house and he's screaming and yelling in prayer to God like that. My son-in-law's serious. He's serious. This guy's for real. (laughs) See, whether you believe I am or not anyway, I already know I am, so I'm not threatened by what anybody believes because I live with me and know me. (laughs) See how powerful that is? It's amazing. Thanks, man. You are amazing. Thanks. <laughs> We're going to take a break real quick. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Okay? So you, the law was a tutor to point you to Christ. What the law did was expose the standard of, of identity, character, integrity that you were created to live in. By the Spirit of God. But when man fell and got separated from God, he's still called to the same thing. It's still his destiny. It's still his identity. But in the flesh, he's powerless to fulfill that because without God, you can't live like him. Which proves that the Christian life is redemption back to the fulfillment of the law. You don't have to fail like you think and believe. People think and believe they have to fail all the time. And because they believe that, they entertain that. People think they have to sin. Some people actually believe they sin while they're breathing. I've had people say, Dan, we sin while we breathe. I said, man, get saved. Get born again. (laughs) That is so sin conscious. Sin while we breathe. Get saved. We have sold this gospel so short. Look, it says what the law could not do. You fulfilling a standard impossible. Right? That it was weak through the flesh. But God did it by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So, through Christ, God fulfilled everything on behalf of man that He was created to walk in and live in from the beginning. And now that same spirit comes into us and quickens our mortal body, gives us wisdom, imparts to us. And now we no longer again, if you read this chapter further, live by the flesh. We live by the spirit. And even if I, which I'm not thinking, well, yeah, but brother, we're not perfect. But what are you saying? You never sin. That's the questions we, that's our minds are so geared there. That when you start talking on righteousness, people ask the sin perfect questions. Because that's where we're geared. You'll find that if you'll just fix on righteousness, you'll be nowhere near sin consciousness and you'll be amazed how long you can live without even the conscious awareness of sin or the need to even address anything because you're right with God. See, that freaks people out to talk about that. It sounds like heresy to the average Christian ear. Yeah, you'd be amazed. You can just live in Him. You enjoy Him. You wake up like a son and you live like a son. You wake up righteous and bear your fruit to holiness. Your heart is in agreement and one with Him. And if for a second you get out of that, you know it immediately because you're in the light as He's in the light. And then all you can do is be thankful for the light that keeps you separate, that sanctifies you, that translates you into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And you're not trying to walk a straight line. You're having fun being a son. 
Are you getting this? Take a break. <laughs> Take a break. We're, we're, we're sharing all this stuff that we're sharing about vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well, the only way to get to that place is to get a firm, secure identity and see yourself the way God sees you, right? It's through His love, perfect love, perfect love. God's love is perfect. So it's the answer. So that's where we're heading. So you have to receive that love to ever become that love, right? But the goal of the Father isn't just that you be loved by God. There's a big emphasis in the church right now, receiving the love of the Father and the Father loving you and the Father loving you. That's awesome. I'm all about that. But the goal of God in loving you this way is that He multiply and reproduce that love in you and through you. That you become the representation of the love of God. It's not just about you being loved by God. It's about you ultimately becoming that love. As He is, so are we. It's the perfection of love to becoming one. So the finished work of Christ isn't exalted and fulfilled when a man prays a prayer to go to heaven and get his name in a book. Sounds like blasphemy to us in America. That is not the finished work of Christ glorified and exalted. It's when a man's nature is transformed and converted back to love, his original created value. Did you get that? So the finished work of Christ is fulfilled when a man is born again and old things pass away and behold all things are new that's the fulfillment of the cross of Christ that's the payoff to the father that's the glory of the inheritance in the saints the deposit of the blood of the son of God into the earth and the payback dividends and interest of reproduced after his own kind one seed into the ground, springing up, bearing much fruit. Christians, body of Christ, firstborn among many, predestined to be conformed to His image. It's all in the book. I read this book. Do you get it? So the fulfillment and glorification of the resurrection of Christ is when a man gets converted and transformed back to what he was in the beginning. It's the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's the hope of his calling. It's his purpose in your redemption. Do you get it? So God has a purpose in your redemption. It's not about you just going to heaven. God has a great purpose in sending His Son. It's redeeming the value of your life and the destiny and legacy of your life. That's what love does. So love didn't throw you out when you didn't look like a son. Love didn't throw you out and give up on you when you didn't act like you were created to. Love looked way beyond that and said, Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And took the hit so we can rise up. Love is amazing. God's amazing. Amen. So let's look at Colossians here. We were, we were in Colossians, you know. We were in verse 3. And 4, 4, at least anyone with persuasive words. And then you, you read something like that, and then it brings up all these other topics. Uh, it was like Jenny and I, on the break we talked, like when I was talking about that, you're not vulnerable to the world you live in, and there's redemption, we're studying a fallen man, and we're saying this has to be the way it is for me. Uh, menstrual cycles we talked about. We really did, on the break. And... Uh, and uh, <laughs> and menopause and see that becomes scientific that becomes that's all of a sudden everybody has to have this and go through this and you're set up the stage is set for you to go through all that in the world and wonder if in your precious I was going to say little woman of God heart big woman of God heart yeah <laughs> wonder if you just settle that wait a minute none of that's my creative value none of that's in my lineage none of that's waiting for me I have no man on earth called no man my father I, my heritage my bloodline my genetics go back to the beginning before man ever ate the tree when father said let us make man in our image and I don't believe Eve before the tree was destined for all this stuff because all of a sudden it begins to be and it's not something you contend for and strive for and pray towards it's just something you see and you believe it and you go, whoa, wait a minute. I am not in any way in that line. 
This is not my heritage. I'm not going through that. If you're a young lady and every month you've been just struggling bad and it's been your reality, it makes it hard sometimes it seems to just... But the deal is saying, wait a minute. I don't have to pray my way through this. This isn't even who I am. This is... You didn't make me this way, God. This, this came through the tree. I'm as... If I've never eaten the tree and there's a place... There's a couple people that I could introduce you to that had babies and didn't feel anything because they believe that oh that's fun for any woman that had a child you would say that would be fun (laughs) I know people personally that had over the years or so many testimonies terrible menstrual stuff paralyzing crippling stuff and all of a sudden they got a revelation that wait a minute this isn't in my this isn't the order of the day and all of a sudden they're not even on anything for that it doesn't even come anymore in fact if you be humble right now this is my spirit and you suffer that way monthly as a woman stand to your feet we're just going to establish something right now stand to your feet don't be embarrassed that's awesome stand to your feet be, be bold it's, see because it's nothing to be ashamed about when you stand up you're saying hey this is not who I am This has been my experience, but you know what? I'm bold enough to stand up and say, wait a minute. There's more to my created value than this. This is not who I am. So it's not about, oh, you're going through that? No. It's about saying, no, today I'm making a declaration that, wait a minute, I wasn't created for this. It's not something I have to contend and cry out and pray and confess over my body. I'm going to stand and affirm that, you know what? This is not who I am. I'm going to, by faith, lay it aside, and I'm receiving today a new identity and destiny in this area of my life. Fair enough? So, Father, right now, I thank you that these women stand, and we all thank you, God, that they were not created for pains, cramps, to be capsized, paralyzed, captivated (laughs) once a month, and then all of a sudden expect that. I thank you that you created them for your glory. You created them in your image. You created them for your good pleasure. And I thank you these symptoms of mental cycling, cramping, pains, nausea, whatever it might be, bloating, have nothing to do with who they are and who you created them to be. The fact that Eve ever ate that tree, that Adam ever ate that tree, has been made null and void. We stand before you as if we've never eaten the tree. And there is redemption for these ladies. And we speak it over their bodies. And we thank you, Father, right now for the redemption of their being right now. And we thank you and rejoice today that every day for the rest of their life will be different because of your goodness and your grace and we just thank you that there's an alignment and a normal flow the way Eve was before that tree was ever eaten will be their experience in Jesus name we bless you ladies amen amen thanks for being humble to stand Got one in the back. She was excited about that. She was like, yes. She's like, I'm taking that. She's like, yeah, I was looking at her calendar. Come on, let's get there. I can't wait. Almost there, baby. I'm having fun with you guys. Ah, but the whole menopause thing, too. You know, because people say that. It's just the language. It's natural knowledge because it's everybody's going through it. So you expect it. And then you say, well, you know how it is. Well, I'm going through that. And then if somebody talks like I'm talking, it's heard as high-minded. Or super hypo-spiritual or something. Well, no. Why not just, why not just settle in your heart? Hey. Come on, you got every, every male in your family that goes through something at a certain age and then you expect it. And the only reason you're praying right up on that age is because you're afraid you're next. At what point do you say, Father, I thank you that I'm not subject to anything that's followed my generations, the heritage of my family lineage. I am not subject to any curse. I am blessed by you. I am not in fear of this thing. And I thank you that I am a brand new creature. The man that was in line for that has died already and there's a brand new man that lives and I thank you for the freedom you've brought to my life and you never pray about it again I'm telling you that'll change your life I, 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 I saw a man that all the males in their family died of heart disease by a very young age and, and I told him and this was a long time ago I wasn't saved that long I was just pastoring and so this is 14 years ago I said don't you go praying all summer because you're about to hit that age that's fear 
I said, you lift your hands and thank God that you're not in line. And then don't you ever pray again. And just thank Him that you're free. That's good. There's a whole lot of stuff like that. People, well, that's in my, well, that's my family. Well, yeah, but my grandmom and my mom. So, and this is around the age. And, and we, we accept it. No, you're not in line. In the bloodline of Jesus. Amen? And it is, that's not high-minded. Cynical people, people that don't understand, have a field day with what I'm preaching. Because they don't understand. They'll mock and scoff what they don't understand. That's called human pride. If you don't understand, you probably ought to get understanding. Okay. <laughs> For though I'm absent in the flesh, verse 5, yet I'm with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So he's encouraging their what? Their steadfastness of faith in Christ. Why? Because they're in the world and they're going through things and they're being tried and tested and there's great persecution and people are going through stuff and circumstances come and adversity comes and trials come and sometimes somebody just runs into your bumper. Oh, don't say that, brother. Sometimes somebody does and then you go, oh my God, why did God let this happen? I mustn't be under the covering. I must have, where did I miss it? Where did I? And you throw your identity away and go haywire in your mind because somebody ran into your bumper. That's what happens. And we, we reveal that we've defined the gospel as a perfect course of events. The gospel guarantees me a perfect course of events. I don't know. I'm not asking for trouble, but the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers them out of them all. So if your eyes right, you don't even see it as affliction. I don't think Paul and Silas saw it as affliction when they were chained and their backs were hanging open 39 lashes. That's pretty serious persecution. They're worshiping God and praising God. It was from the heart. All of a sudden the place shook and God set them free. Man, if they had a mentality like a lot of folks have, they could, well, why can't you protect us, God? You think you could watch my back? I'm only trying to lay down my life to save some souls. You think you could protect me? God, I've been beat now. I've been all the stoned. I, I don't know if I want to go into another city and open my mouth if you're not going to do a better job of protecting me. But obviously their life wasn't their own and they understood that at the cost of their life they're following Jesus that souls might be saved and they're never going to die. Take your best shot. I'm never going to die. That's what they're saying. I'm alive. Death is defeated. I'm never going to die. So why not run well and leave a legacy even if it costs me what seems like my life? Because it's not. My life is in Him. So I'm going to seek the things that are above and not the things on the earth. Why? Because I died and my life is in Christ. Colossians 3. That's the next chapter. We'll never get there. The school's only 13 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Catch it on the next school. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just <laughs> I mean, my faith is shattered on that one. See, see I'm preaching faith, but there's some areas I'm shook. <laughs> like when I say, look, I'm wrapping up, I have no faith for that. So I don't expect you to. <laughs> you know what I mean? The only reason I stop when I do is because it's 12 and there's another day. But... <laughs> Praise God. Isn't God good? I'm having fun. Thanks for being here. As you, so he's telling them to be steadfast in Christ. He's rejoicing. Man. Steadfast faith in Christ. Okay, verse 6. This is huge. You guys ready? As you therefore have received Christ. How do you receive Christ? By faith. You have to believe He's the Lord. You have to believe He was a man and died on the cross. You have to believe He raised from the dead and was seated to the right hand of God. You have to believe that He died because your life's worth living. You have to believe. Right? So you're justified by faith. So as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? So walk in Him. Do you see why I'm so intense about not living sensual? Not living by the way it seems and feels and the way you think or the way others think. 
Because in Him is all the wisdoms of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Him is your life revealed. In Him is the wisdom of God and the truth. He is the truth, not a truth. This is that adamant. I mean, it's a big deal. So, so walk in Him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. What's the faith? The faith is who you've become now that He died and rose again. Who you are in light of Him. That's the faith. You contend for that. You fight for that. It's a good fight because God doesn't change His mind. It's already settled. You're loved. You're lovable. You always will be. You have destiny. You have potential. You always will. In your deepest failure, the door is still open to succeed. (gasps) In your most lost state, the door is still open to come home. In your deepest hour of ignorance and a lack of understanding, there's still knowledge and understanding waiting for you. The door doesn't go closed where God's concerned. Yeah. So the faith, fighting for the faith, one faith, contending for the faith, all those phrases you read all through the New Testament, especially in Paul's writing, Peter writes about the faith too. The faith's all through the Bible. It all has to do with maintaining, securing, and resting in and walking in who you are now that he's come it has nothing to do with punching the devil in the mouth you can't find that in the Bible it has nothing to do with getting in some fight spiritual warfare is so over preached and crossing boundaries there's a place for spiritual warfare we have turned it into the faith spiritual war fighting the good fight of faith we think is spiritual warfare Fighting good fight of faith is in the face of every temptation of sensuality, feelings, what it seems and seems not, to stand firm and say, nothing's changed, Christ is Lord and He's in me and I'm loved by God. I'm already right, I'm already accepted, I'm already acceptable. Even where you look at the weapons of, of, of a war that we're wrestling not with flesh and blood, but spiritual, and we're putting on the armor, the, the way we fight is not getting in a ring and wrestling the devil. You fight by putting on your armor and holding up the shield of faith and wielding the sword of the Spirit. So it's the truth that makes you free. You're not fighting the devil. You're standing in truth in the midst of chaos and pandemonium and every other suggestion. You follow me? And that's something that's not understood a lot. We're, we're, we're chasing after the devil. He loves when you pay attention to him. I promise you, he loves when you walk your floor, binding, rebuking, telling him where he's going to be one day and getting in this mouth battle with the devil. He loves when you do that. Because he's a cut off withering branch coming to nothing. And he loves when you pay him attention because he's so insecure, so freaked out in fear and so lost. And he loves when you make him somebody. Don't feed his addiction. Let him starve in insecurity. (laughs) I'm serious. Don't you feed his addiction. He wants you to fear him. He wants you to believe him instead of the God that created you. He loves when he can reproduce himself after his own kind and take what was made in the image of God and make it look just like he looks and feels. He loves when a Christian that has every hope and covenant and promise before them is hopeless just like he is. He loves when people made to be like God are like him. He loves it. He loves when you're afraid, freaked out with fear because he is so afraid the trumpets blow and he is freaked out that today might be the day that in a moment he might face eternal damnation and judgment. When Jesus walked the earth, devils were freaked out. Why have you come to torment us before our time? Come on, this seems way too soon. We know what's coming and we fear you. (sighs) Man, we ought to learn from that, guys. They are freaked out by Jesus. So why wouldn't they be freaked out by Christ in you? 
So in hopes that you never see who you are because of him, they try to get you to keep seeing who you are apart from him so you never get a revelation so they don't have to be freaked out by you. Because if you ever see what they know, it's over. Come on. So that's keep them self-conscious, self-centered, hurt, offended, rational thinking, human wisdom. Let's separate them. Let's just get them to not be able to agree. Let's just make a lot of doctrines, theologies, camps based on their experiences. Let's get them off of one word, one truth. The Lord is one. Our God is one. And let's multiply them and divide them into many streams, rivers, and camps. And let's just get them to fight instead of be one. Let's just get them to be proud and arrogant and self-righteous. And let's get it all about them, their heritage, and what they believe in their upbringing. Let's keep them offended, touchable, and reachable so they never take on Christ. The same time they can go to church, we don't mind that. Let's just make sure they're religious in their going. That's the devil. Bible says don't you be unaware of his devices and don't you give him any place you're the steward of your heart don't you give him any place the more you become like Christ (laughs) it's a good thing (laughs) amen can you imagine the horror in the demonic world when Christ raised from the dead And the mystery of God was revealed to the enemy that he played right into the hand of God like a fool, like a pawn. And he actually killed the Son of God. And now all men could go free. He shed innocent blood and slayed the Lamb. He was blinded to all that. In God's infinite wisdom, he just pulled back and let him do what he does. Steal, kill, destroy, steal, kill, destroy. And now he kills the Son of God. And because of that, we can all live. Imagine the horror for a minute that hits him. I can't defeat God. How do I defeat God? If I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't have done it. Oh my God, I killed the Son of God. I got a vision a long time ago, uh, a little picture of the devil doing that and hell freaking out and and chaos and yelling at each other and blaming each other. and, And then I saw this little light bulb go off in the devil's head. He said, wait a minute, guys, calm down, pull together. It's not that bad. Look, we can't beat God and we know it, but we can beat them and we know it. They're going to keep loving themselves. They'll not love God more than their own lives. They won't surrender. They won't give up. Are you kidding? Every one of them at heart is just like us. They're all about themselves and we'll make sure that it stays that way. And we'll make sure that we work and finagle and poke and prod in as many areas as we can to make sure they never get a revelation of what was accomplished here. We'll turn it into legalism and works. We'll get them to hurt each other. We'll get them hurt so bad at young ages in church that they won't even want to think about church. We'll get them so mad at God. We'll get them to think God killed their kids and God killed their parents and God killed their loved ones. We'll scramble this thing up. We'll deceive. We'll do what we do best, guys. We'll blind. We'll deceive. We'll lie. But they'll believe us because they really live for themselves. Get in here, guys. Let's go. Break. It's a little vision I got long time ago it's the only power he has to blind our eyes from seeing but I promise you he doesn't believe that one of us loves God more than our own life he believes you just need God for your life no I need God to become my life I'm not incorporating him into who I am I want him to make me who I am follow me oh it feels real passionate and intense right now I feel real sober sorry for if I'm freaking you out by talking soft (laughs) man this thing's real I've seen enough devils in people and around people they're real they're not to be feared and honored in the way that we tend to but they are real. And they're seeking whom they may devour. They're looking for vulnerability, fear, access points, weakness, wrong motives, vulnerabilities. 
Give him no place. So as you've received Christ the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted on the verse 7, Colossians 2, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you've been taught. See, hopefully we've been taught. Here, here Paul knows he's taught this. Now, now, if you were the devil and you were afraid of a revelation, wouldn't you try to manipulate teaching? Wouldn't you try to soft pedal, sugarcoat, twist, contort? Wouldn't you try to get a lot of different angles and views? out there and confuse the belief system of the church right as you have been taught not all of us have been taught this we've been taught you better go to church better keep this boat floating keep this ship running you better stay faithful here and and all that stuff it's been about us building a kingdom instead of manifesting the kingdom come on See, all this is, this is awesome. All this is a blessing. If the reason is right. There ain't a thing wrong with all this. These, these, well, these ain't even four walls. This is a kingdom building. This is a lot of walls. But you know what I mean by four walls? This four wall thing, this is, this is just a blessing if it's all for the right reason. It doesn't have to be traditional and religious. And it's all for the right reason. It's all about manifesting the kingdom. Beware. This is amazing language here. Stay with me, guys. Sorry I got so intense on you. I can't help what I do. Beware, beware, beware. What a word. What's your message Bible say, dude? (laughs) Verse 8. Oh, man. I want you to read 7. It just says watch. In other words, watch. Be sober. Uh, does anybody have anything other than beware ooh I like that what translation is that new American go new American anybody are serious that's good translation man see to it that so it sounds like you're the steward of that right so you gotta be sober and vigilant be watchful message says watch Watch, be sure, make sure. So all that, that's the connotation there. Beware, least anyone. Anyone. Now that doesn't make people enemies. Some people mean well and say things for they think for all the right reason, but it doesn't mean it's truth. Do you get what I'm saying? So just because somebody doesn't agree with you, it doesn't make them your enemy. Yeah, there's well-meaning people. There's people out there laying down their life and doing certain things and, 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 and they honestly believe it's right. And I don't know where all that pans out in the end. I don't know how all that works. But we're called to love one another. And don't make enemies with people. Flesh is not your war. It's the thing that's trying to manipulate and construe flesh into something less than Christ. That's the war. Okay? So beware at least anyone. It doesn't make people a threat to you. It makes doctrines, mindsets, mentalities... The yell butts of life are very dangerous. Yell butts. Yeah, that's good, brother, but you have to face the reality that we yell, brother, but not every... That, that, you could come up with a lot, you could just, there's a lot of them out there, right? I I don't have time for them. I'm not going to listen to them. You know, the Bible says that Uh, He talks about uh, sexual immorality a couple places. It's intense. It sounds intense. Some of us don't want to even talk about this stuff. It talks about fornication, sexual immorality, and all this stuff. And it says, uh, be be sure or be not deceived. And uh, another one says, let no one deceive you with empty words. And then it lists this category of just willful sexual immorality. And then, you know, we say, yeah, but look, God loves us. He doesn't judge us. Well, God knows our heart. Well, this and that. We have this line that accommodates our lifestyle. And yet the Bible says, look, don't let anybody deceive you. You need to get a battery or something. Hey, ho. What's going on, man? I might... Oh. 
<laughs> I, I want that so bad. <laughs> All the blood Jesus shed for me to get me free. And then they put one of these in my hand. And they bind me. You should say, I'm so terrible with these. God help me. I know, change your confession, Dan. I'm really good with these. No, actually, I have been terrible with them. I'd be like, I would talk. <laughs> they gave me a couple of these already. Oh, God. Okay, it says in verse 8, beware, lest anyone give you a hand, I mean, uh, a handheld mic, yeah, but, I mean, wait, wait, I, does your Bible say that, or am I just, beware, lest anyone bind you, with, wait, 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 we'll recover, we'll recover, beware, lest anyone cheat you, oh my goodness, that's serious language. You know, another translation says plunder or hold you or take you captive or prisoner. This is serious. He's talking about living by faith, guys. You can't live by faith and live sensual at the same time. It's one or the other, right? Right? Oh, I know Jesus is my Savior. But dude, you're right there on the list. <laughs> Oh, come on, go on the ear. Yeah. Ah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Ooh. This will work. Look at that. That wasn't so bad. Ah. Oh. Oh. Resurrection time. The stone has rolled away. I am pumped now. Thanks, buddy. You rescued me. Watch this. Beware. See to it. Be careful. Be watchful that no one cheat you, plunder you, hold you captive. What's some other translations out there? Anybody? Spoil you. Try to dazzle you. Anybody else? Well, BJ, grab a mic. Get that to... It's Olivia, right? Get that to Olivia so she can read that. That's amplified version. It's just good. I want you to read that in the mic, okay? You can just read the verse because we're going to cover it. See to it that no one carries you off as spoil or makes you yourselves captives by his so-called philosophy and intellectualism and vain deceit, idle fancies, and plain nonsense following human tradition, men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world, just crude notions following the rudimentary and elemental teachings of the universe and disregarding the teachings of Christ the Messiah. Oh my. <laughs> so here we are, living in a church world that's afraid to think and be spiritual and if you are, you're marked and you've got to face reality and get real, brother, and... They're going to make me cry. I'm going to have a hard time getting through this one. Did you hear what the Bible says? See, we're called, we're called free. And he says, make sure nobody ties you up and makes you a prisoner. You're free. Don't be a prisoner through intellect and human tradition and the world's way of thinking and natural material evidence and things and not the spiritual world. And here we are in the church afraid to be spiritual if we're not careful. At large being judged if we're even suggesting that uh, menopause isn't your created value. That's a hypo thought, dude. Get real. You need to come down to the earth. That's what we think. I'm like, there ain't no way. It took, me a, it took Jesus a lot of blood and me a lot of time to, to get off and out of the earth. I'm not coming back in that sense. See what I mean? Come on. The, I tell a story sometimes, and you probably heard it, but it's in me now. I was working in a warehouse, and a lot of co-workers that were Christians came out of the woodwork, most of them, when I got saved because they found confidence in the expression of my life. And they, people, honestly, I'm not being rude, that I had no idea even went to church. 
stood up. At least they stood up, praise God. But they said, hey, we're Christians too. And I, I, in, a, in one sense, I'm young in the Lord. I'm like, you are? I was shocked. Because their only understanding was a Christian goes to church. But that's all that means. But when they saw my life, there was convictions that came. So we started to get together to pray and meet. And it was good. It was about 11 of us. Or 11 people rose up. Well, in the process, I started reading my Bible and reading when the first time we took communion, that was the end of our prayer group because I took communion and I saw things through communion. Nobody ever taught me how to take communion. I'm a baby Christian. Chronologically, I don't have background schooling. I just got saved. But we're taking communion and I'm looking. It's the body. It's the blood. I'm looking at the body and what it paid and the blood. And I had a very clear revelation of communion at a very young age in the Lord. So I'm sharing this and, and the, it busted up the prayer group because I was suggesting that people could be healed that it's God's will that he paid the price for our restoration Dan you're way off balance you're way out of order people are going to get hurt through that teaching because not everybody's healed the reality is not everybody's going to be healed and now you're putting pressure on people people are going to get condemned if they're not healed and you can't believe that way and you just got trusted to the sovereign mercy of God and I'm like huh I, see I don't even have the ability to think like that I don't even want to I don't want to think that deep. I want to read it here, see it in his life, and like a child, go after it till it's my reality. And, I, and anything that tries to talk me out of it along the way, I won't make you my enemy if it's a person. I just won't take it to heart. I don't have to say yes. That doesn't make me dogmatic and willful and over-aggressive and always needing to be right. You can call it whatever you want. I'm following him. Now, I can do that and still protect my heart and not get hard along the way. Now, what some people do is they get so militant this way, they get hard this way. And they're on this lonely journey into spirituality, mad at everybody. And, and you get high-minded, and when you talk, you talk down to people instead of to people. And, but did you hear what Olivia read there? We're called, there's freedom in Christ. And, and, and we have liberty and freedom and through the Spirit and where the Spirit is there's liberty and, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed and, and now we have a scripture saying be careful and even says that I'm a prisoner and enslaved to righteousness that means I am tied and bound to serve a life sentence of righteousness <laughs> judged for life righteous forever <laughs> tie him up Throw away the key. <laughs> I'm walking out my life sentence. I'm only like 16 years into my eternal life sentence. <laughs> I am forever judged righteous. And there's no escape. I'm a slave and a prisoner to serve it forever. How cool. That's the language of the Bible. You're a slave to righteousness. You're bound. When you look up the words, it actually means to literally be held captive by, to be imprisoned to, to be tied and chained to. Righteousness. There's no other verdict. <laughs> You're not guilty. No. <laughs> it's all right here. But the, as you receive him, you have to what? So... Walk in Him in the face of life, the world, feelings, all the things sin taught you, all the things the fall taught you, all the things the devil tutored us in through self-centered, selfish, self-preserving mentality. Everything we learn from little up still tries to come and have a voice and ownership and try to have sway and still tries to lead and guide. And you have to be very careful you don't have a mixed drink of theology and you have the way that seems right to man laced through the one and true gospel dies something new lives old passes away all things all things transformed by the renewing that means the old way is gone you're renewed it's a new way of thinking of seeing of living and it's not hypo spiritual and it's not out of balance it's following him it's get your mind in the heavens you say, brother, you need to come down to the earth. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That is a religious phrase straight from hell. You're so heavenly minded, you're a whole lot of earthly good. Really? It's just a, it's a phrase from hell. 
Because what people are saying is, you weird us out. We want you to relate. You need to relate to us. You need to face reality. You need to get real. You need to... Come on, could you imagine that conversation with Jesus? He's heading to Lazarus' tomb. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, he's dead. Yeah, we're going to go get him up. I'm glad for your sake, because now you'll see the glory of God. Uh, excuse me. So we get there, it'll be four days. Our Jewish culture says after three, the spirit leaves the body. I mean, who do you think you are? <laughs> He's going to be rotten. His flesh is going to stink. There's probably going to be bugs and maggots. Let's be real. He's probably going to be disfigured. He's going to be so swelled and so what? He's just going to get up and walk? Come on, let's just leave it alone. Let's stop. That's because wonder if he doesn't get up. Man, you're going to blow up your ministry. You're going to look like a fool. And I don't think we should go there. Look, he's with God. He's, look, he's with the Lord. Come on. Can you imagine... The way we think and talk. It, it, can you even try to imagine talking to Jesus like we talk to one another? That'd be a good way to get your thinking sobered. Because if you couldn't have that conversation with Jesus and make it fly, why does it fly when we're alone with one another? <laughs> Ooh, I'm on it. I'm having a good day at school today. <laughs> I hope you're here tomorrow. <laughs> no, it's good. Serious? Do you hear what I'm saying? Come on, you try to sell that to Jesus, it ain't flying. <laughs> it's called supernatural. It's our calling, it's our destiny, it's our lifestyle. It's not natural, it's supernatural. We were reduced to the natural. Because some people have taken that thing to extremes and, and sometimes we see the good, bad and ugly. We try to throw out the baby with the bath water. That's a mistake we make. Just because people have mishandled the supernatural, because people have crossed certain lines and gotten weird and opened bigger doors and sort of whatever's happened, it's, that's irrelevant. There's still a truth there to pursue. It's called the kingdom of God on the earth through my life. It's called me being free and living beyond what I ever was before Christ came. Do you get it? There's still a beautiful truth to be pursued. Okay, don't let anyone cheat you. Through philosophy, man's ideas, right? Traditions. Empty, my Bible says, empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Here's a phrase we say, well, brother, you just need to use some common sense. I don't want sense that's common. <laughs> just like I don't want the common cold. <laughs> what are we doing? See, because it's the common cold, it's common when you get it. Because it's the common, well, you know it's going around, brother. That thing's really going around. Oh, yeah, I got it. It's really going around. Man, everybody has it. That's how we talk. But then we try to use principles of faith to feel better and to get better. And to get our healing, but we're expecting to get it because it's common to men. And it's really going around, you know. What? There's always something going around. <laughs> Why do we have to catch everything that's going around? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just funny. You got a fellow like, do you ever read up on John G. Lake? Do you guys ever check up on some of his writings? John G. Lake rocks, man. Yeah, it's, that's how I feel about John G. Lake. That was good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> The guy, the guy is, is on the shore burying people full of bubonic plague. They're laying dead everywhere. You say, well, why wasn't he raising them from the dead? Oh, I don't know, but he's on the shore. He's burying them. He's doing the best he can. He's doing what he can. That critical, cynical thing that always is challenging things. The bottom line is the man's there and he's not afraid. And he's doing what he can and he's praying and he knows it's a plague and he knows it's a devil. And the, and the British Red Cross pulls their ship up and they say, my God, man, you need to get protection. You're touching them men with no protection. He said, oh, sirs, I have the protection that I need. And they said, you're not wearing anything. Bubonic plague, highly contagious, killing thousands. There's John right G. Lake in the middle of all that. He says, oh, yes, sir. Sirs, I do, for I have Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life through Christ. It has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now see, wonder if he does believe that. Then leave him alone. Don't say because you're afraid, well you better use wisdom. If he believes that, he believes that. 
See, we take people into Sunday school when they're little tiny kids and believe there's a pink elephant in the field if you point and say it. They're looking and we laugh. We do that stuff to kids, you know. Hey, look at a pink elephant. Where? Oh, I missed it, Mommy. Turn around. Because they just believe it. So then we take them into Sunday school and we tell them these amazing, ridiculous stories. We open a book called the Bible and we tell them all this wild stuff. And we tell them it happened and that it's God and all things are possible and to put your trust in Him. And then we tell them about a little boy killing a giant and walls that fell down in an army and a whale had a man in the belly for three days and the guy didn't even have acid burns, I don't think. He just caught him out on the beach and he went and did the will of God. And We just tell about stuff. How a sea parted and people walked on dry land. We talk about carrying and, and grapes bigger than men. and oh, We tell them all this stuff. But then when they get old enough and, and in need of exercising faith and standing on the gospel leaving, we get afraid and we say, well, you better use wisdom. <laughs> Why? Because somebody died along the way believing. Somebody didn't get healed along the way. And then all of a sudden we mark everybody based on the bad and ugly and Throw away the word because, hey, and it's just sentiment, guys. It's sentiment. Some of the times that I needed to be in faith the most, the people that loved me most were telling me to seek another way because they were afraid for me personally. They were coveting me personally as a friend, a relationship. It had nothing to do with wisdom. (laughs) Wisdom had to do with not letting them cheat me and rob me and take me captive now that I finally am free. See, it all worked out all right. I'm okay. Well, that's up for debate. (laughs) It depends who you ask. (laughs) But I'm doing just fine. You got witchcraft pressing down on your flesh. You don't need anything but the gospel. And you sure don't need to be afraid. You got some disease that's eating you that's incurable. You better know who Christ is and who you are because of him. It's not time to just get in the natural and do all the research and get yourself all the more freaked out. When my wife was in trouble, I said to the doctor, Sir, I respect you and honor you, but now's not the time for me to get a medical education. You do what you're trained for. I'll do what I was trained for. I love you and appreciate you. That's just what I said to him. You do what you've been trained for. I appreciate you. You help my wife the best you know. I'll do what I've been trained for. And he made a comment like, What do you mean? What's that? And I told him what I've been trained for. And he said, well, I appreciate your heart in that, but I'm a realist and I have to face the reality. I said, sir, you've missed everything I've said. I have faced the reality. I read that book and it's the word of the living God and my wife will be okay. And I just wasn't afraid. telling you, you can listen to your best friend in some of those situations. And they're still your friend and they still mean well. What they say might not be the words of a best friend. I promise you, you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. (laughs) And if you ain't saying what he's saying, I love you, (laughs) but I will ignore you. You can tell me I'm in spiritual pride. You can judge my heart and tell me what I am and what I'm not. But see, I happen to know me. When that doctor had to do surgery on my torn knee, torn meniscus or whatever it was, there was something in there, Tor. And I told him, you're not going to touch me with that knife, sir. And he said, now listen, there's nothing wrong with getting the surgery. I'm a Christian too. God's gifted me and I've helped thousands of people recover through the wisdom and the gifting God has given me. I said, I believe that and I appreciate that and I thank God for that. That is not my issue that I'm too big for a surgery. I'm not too spiritual for a surgery. That isn't why I said it, sir. Because see, as soon as we think we're just afraid to go to a doctor, ashamed to go to a doctor, we, we, we impose believing on one another. 
We assume motive. And we judge the hearts of one another. And we think we know why people do what they do. But you better be careful because you might be wrong. And they might be completely in faith. And your fear and irrationality in the world is trying to talk them out of what God has built them for. And they're about ready to see a mountain move. And just because you can't see it, you're trying to talk them out of the way they're going. Be very careful with that. A sad day we get before the Lord and find that we've talked each other out of faith instead of building us in the faith. But this doctor meant well, and he said, I'm a Christian too, because we were obviously talking about the Lord, and, and he said, it's, it's, it's okay if you get a surgery. It's not a da-da-da-da-da. And I said, that has nothing to do, that's not my issue. And he was like, well, then what is? And I held my hands out like this. I said, doctor, where is the power of God? Where's the power of the name of Jesus that you speak his name? Things change. Thank God for your willingness, your sacrifice, your years of college, your years of medical. Thank God for the people you've truly helped. Thank God for that. But where is the power of his name? That when you speak his name, things change. I said, sir, tears were running down my face. I said, I'm going to have it. It's going to be mine. And I'm not going to stop looking till I find it. He said, you're really serious about this. I said, you have no idea. I said, I'm playing it cool for you. Tears were just coming down my face. I walked back in two days later when he had the finished MRI. And the diagnosis that said I had a severely torn knee that needed immediate medical surgery and five months rehab. But I walked into his office like you see me walking now. Because that night I laid on my couch and worshipped Jesus and thanked him. My life is in him and I trust you. And that mighty Holy Spirit came and knelt down beside the couch I was laying on and just sewed up my knee in the supernatural power of God. And I could feel God mending my knee and I was crying. His presence was all over me and I said, I love you, I honor you and I am not afraid. And I stood up and I could walk without crutches. My knee was no longer like a football and I'm walking through my house worshiping Jesus, worshiping Jesus because my motive isn't too spiritual for a surgery, ashamed to go to a doctor, don't want to ruin my testimony, my aggression, my passion, my message. This thing is not about me. It's about Christ in me follow me any of those other motives you don't have the knee doing this you have confusion wonderment despair but I prayed why I promise you when it's not about you it opens some pretty big doors (laughs) and they have to be big because the one that comes through is awesome (laughs) see That might not have happened to your knee, but it happened to mine. Now you have to deal with folks like me. Because it was tore. It needed surgery. The MRI and medical knowledge said five months rehab. I sat up off my couch and I'm healed. I walked into the doctor's office just like this. And he's reading my report. I think I hear the words of Isaiah. Who has believed our report? For to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? (sighs) Man, I'm feeling this thing. I'm having trouble. (laughs) He said, Dan, how... uh, 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 He's like, your knee looks great. How are you walking? (laughs) He's reading the report. Just the wrong one. If you take on the identity of that paper and try to fight your way to God and through God, you're in big trouble. Yeah, but your knee. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but shh, settle down, relax. Don't you fix your eyes on the things you're seeing. Because the things that you don't see are eternal. That's what I mean by not living central, guys. I've had plenty of opportunities to do so. 
I've got a whole lot of cool testimonies in God reality. So this isn't a theology to me. It's not a philosophy. It's not a doctrine. It's my life. It's real. So I had the great privilege of lifting my hands high. I'm halfway through the foyer. There's waiting room and patients everywhere. And I'm right here and they're everywhere. And he's right there at the first office. And he said, how's your knee? How are you, you, how are you walking? And I smiled real big and I raised my hands high. I told you two days ago, sir, I serve a living God. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and he said, come into my office. I need to see you. <laughs> and I walked in and I sat down and I threw my leg because I knew the protocol because I was there two days before. And I couldn't even move my leg. It was powerless. I looked defeated. Looked defeated. You take that to heart, you are defeated. And all you're doing is reduced to sitting there asking a million unanswered questions. Why is this happening? What opened the door? Why are you doing this? Why didn't you protect me? Why? Why? And if you're doing that, you're certainly not in faith. If you're doing that, you're certainly not in healthy identity. If you're doing that, you've been moved by what you're going through instead of affirmed by what he's been through. And now you're just subject to the trials that you face instead of the one that he already faced and conquered. You getting this? So I threw my leg up on the table and I did all the stuff I couldn't do the two days before. And he's just shaking his head. He said, amazing. Put my leg down. He slapped me across the knee and said, my gosh, you're healed. <laughs> I said, <laughs> cool or what? Now, I could have made that all about me for those couple days. Why is this happening, God? I thought I believed, God. Why? But you said in your word. And all of a sudden, now my beef's with God, and I'm taking face value what I'm going through, and now I have an issue with Him, and now I make sure that everybody in the spirit world knows that the only thing I'm doing is pursuing all this for me and my sake. And if things don't go my way, I'm confused, troubled, and betrayed, and maybe even backslidden. Sure doesn't sound like surrendered and dead to yourself and alive unto God and ready to roll. <laughs> so if I'm going to react wrongly, what keeps the devil from just poking and prodding and hitting me again and again and again until he crushes me? Yeah. But in touching me, guess what happened? He helped affirm me, establish me, make sure in me that the things... Wow, gave me the great... The devil gave me the great privilege... Of walking through faith. <laughs> My buddy Todd said one time from the pulpit. And people almost freaked out. He said you got to get to the place in adversity. And da da da. And we had talked about this stuff a lot. And he had been sitting under a lot of preaching. But it was becoming alive in him and real. And he was like whoa. And one day he said. I'll tell you in that day. When we see the devil. I might run up and just give him a big hug. And say thanks for everything you were to my life. You helped form Christ to me. I don't know how to say thank you. But thanks for what you helped happen in me. Oh. <laughs> Boy that sure beats. <laughs> right? Let me wrap this up. Now remember, I got to shoot out of here. You guys know that. Some of you walked in late. I just, I need to meet somebody in New York at about 1230. So I love to hang out and spend time and, and do all that. And I'll do that as much as I can. You guys know that. But today I do have to bolt. So I'll be like, where'd he go? <laughs> Watch this. Beware. See to it. Make sure that no one cheats you, robs you, takes you captive, takes you prisoner. Through philosophy, empty deceit, according to traditions of men, according to basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. Watch. For in Him, who? Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Wow. Full representation of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Right? Full representation of the manifestation of love and deity. And, uh, watch. And you. Oh, look at, the, look at the relationship here. Look how important we are to Him. You're right here in the chapter. <laughs> look, look. He's talking about Jesus being the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And He skips right from Him to you because you and Him are one. And he doesn't want to live without you. Heaven wouldn't be the same without you. 
Watch. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you. Yes, you, you, you. Guess who you are. You are complete in him. If you see yourself in any other way except through him, you will feel incomplete. You will be measured short. You will be insecure, low in your esteem, and fighting to be something you already are. In him you are complete. Is that in your Bible? Do you know he writes that stuff right after telling you to make sure you're living by faith? Because if he didn't tell you that first, you'd read that and say, Well, I don't feel complete. I feel like I got a long way to go. There's something I got to be missing, brother. Right? But he's telling you to live by faith. So if you start rising up and saying, Father, I thank you that I'm completing Christ, and you're revealing the depth of that, the truth of that, the manifestation of that. I thank you I'm not striving anymore. I'm not under pressure to measure up. I'm already in. I've already measured up. You are my measuring stick. I have already completed. I have already accomplished through Christ Jesus. Yay. Thank you for your grace. You see? Because you're what? You're complete in Him who is the head. You're complete in Him. And who is He? The head of all principality and power. So if the one that's the head of all is saying you're complete, you're complete. Oh, so let's be sure we're not such gods unto ourselves like the fall of man. Be a god, be a god. Eat the tree and be your own god that we say, well, yeah, but brother, therefore making ourselves a god. When the head of all says you're complete, guess who you are? You're complete. And faith says so. Faith says, yep. And you begin to grow from that place into that revelation. Amen? So the Christian life is fun. There's some other things we need to cover and establish. We just got on a lot of stuff. That's just the way it will always be, probably. Why don't we do something? Just stand to your feet, could you? With me, please. Just in a sense of honor to God. Let's just honor Him. If there was a... You know, Rick, Rick came up on the break and was talking about the prodigal and putting the coat on the prodigal. And it's a beautiful story, the prodigal. It's a beautiful story in the Garden of Eden uh, after they sinned where he took off their fig leaves and he put on animal skins. He, he, that's a sign of changing your identity. He reclothes you. He re-robes you. He dresses you for himself. So the prodigal, that was a, a sign and Rick was sharing that. It was very good about putting on the coat and how that's a change of identity. And you're not one that just came from the hogs. You're not one that just spent your inheritance. You're not one that just lived frivolous and lascivious. You're home. Your heart's turned. You're back. So home you shall be. You're a son. And he robes him as a son. He marks him as a son. That's what God did to Adam and Eve when he put animal skins. He marked them righteous in his sight. He gave them a hope, a promise, and a future. And he took off the thing that was marking them for sin. And he marked them for promise. So God's the one that clothes you and dresses you with identity. Isn't that beautiful? He forgives you of everything you've ever done. I, I recently, I got this new truck out here and uh, I got it so that I could have, it's kind of a paradox, I got it so I could have cruise control because I'm on the road so much in long, long miles on the highways and I had this little manual truck and I'm like, man, I need to get, and I always drove these little single cab manual trucks and now I got this extended cab, six cylinder automatic with cruise control. It's a blessing. And yet, when you're going 50, it feels like 35. I've never felt anything like it. I'm like, whoa, I'm still getting used to it. And I got 10,000 miles on the thing. It just catches me. I'm on a backcountry road and I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> And then when I gear down, it feels like I can back off. It feels like I'm hardly moving. But, and I'm thinking, is this odometer right? But when you go by the little flashy things on the turnpike that tell you how fast you're going, it's working. You got your GPS in and it tells you how fast you're going. It's working. But it doesn't feel like you're going that fast, right? So I'm heading down to Delaware to a conference and I'm on this side road and they're taking me, my GPS is taking me this shortcut way. She's good. My, my GPS is born again. She has no attitude. She doesn't get mad. I can take alternate routes and she blesses me. She's sweet. She's from Australia. She talks Australian. She's amazing. I told my wife, I said, I think you need to know there's this Australian girl goes with me everywhere I go. And she said, what? She's with me all the time. I really like her. And, uh, she's my GPS lady. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm going and, 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 and you know how your GPS will tell you you're in, you know, your speed limit and where you're at and all this and I'm there and I'm in this 40 and I'm looking and I'm going and, and I turn and I'm on this next road and I never realized I went into a 30. I went from a 40 to a 30. Well, 
I feel like I'm only going 35. And I'm driving and I see the police officer sitting up in the driveway out in front of me. And I looked up and you know your first reaction is to look how fast you're going and touch your brake. It's just a reaction. I've done it my whole life. It's like checking out, making sure you're not, because you're not, I'm not out there trying to get away with things. So I looked at the police officer and I, I looked down and I hit my brake a little and I went, oh, I'm just going a little over 40. I'm good. Well, I was in a 30. I'm thinking I'm in a 40. I'm in a new area. I've never been on this road in my life. Well, I just went by him and he comes right out behind me. Whoop, whoop. I'm like, whoa, what? I thought, man. So I pulled over. And, you know, he said, uh, hey, sir, can I see this and that? And I'm in Maryland, right across the line. And I gave him my stuff. He said, I clocked you going 49 and 30. And I said, 49 and 30. He said, yes. He said, is it, is it, do you agree with that? He goes, I said, well, I said, yeah, I said, no, I don't doubt it, man. I said, I got this new truck. I'm having trouble. I said, I only have 1,500 miles on it at the time. I only have 1,500. I said, and, and I'm trying to get used to it. I said, I actually bought it. It's crazy. I bought it for cruise control. But on these country roads and side roads, I get driving, and I'm looking at my GPS, and I'm on a strange road. I, I didn't realize I switched into a speed zone, and I didn't realize that I was going 49. I'm thinking, I'm fine. I saw you sitting there. I even, you know, did the thing where you look and hit your brake, and... I thought, oh, I'm only going 42, 44. But obviously, I, I backed her down from the brakes. And he said, he said, well, I clocked you at 49, going 30. I'm going to have to write you up for that. And I said, man, I was looking for some mercy, you know. And I said, okay. I didn't say, well, I am a pastor heading to a pastor's conference. And I would ask you for mercy. Since God showed me mercy, I would hope you would too, because then maybe he'll give you mercy. <laughs> and if you bless me, you might be blessed. I didn't say none of that. <laughs> He wrote me up and he came to the truck and I was like, man. And I didn't want that on my record. I didn't want that on my insurance. Your insurance abused you for that stuff. You know, you didn't have, a, I have nothing on my driver's record since I was 23 years old. Not one violation, not nothing. 23, I had three tickets in no time and I couldn't even find insurance and it sobered me real quick. And I thought, ooh, this is real. So from 23 on, I have not one mark on my driving record. And now I got this mark and I didn't like a mark. I don't like marks. Who likes marks? And the insurance company sees that and says, oh, you're a liability. And they raise your insurance 40% because you got a ticket or something. And it's like, ah. So he said, here's what I would tell you to do, sir. I tell everybody to do this. He said, fill out a waiver and just plead guilty with an explanation. I said, really? I said, I've never considered doing anything like that for anything. I said, I would just figure I'd pay it. Just go for it. No, he said, I'd encourage you to do a waiver. Okay, I'll look into it. So I take off, do the conference, come back, and I look at this thing. And I thought, I'm going to do a waiver. Anybody ever do a waiver? I did a waiver filled out this waiver thing I go into the Maryland courts I didn't like being on that side man I was the defendant I got the thing in the mail it freaked me out it said uh, Daniel Lynn Moeller versus the state of Maryland I went no fighting anybody I was so freaked out I called him on the phone right away I said I think you're misunderstanding I'm not fighting nobody I'm not a contestant no 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 you signed a waiver that's just legal language I'm like I don't like legal language <laughs> I am a grace and faith and mercy guy I'm not Daniel versus Maryland because <laughs> I would not win I'm not that kind of fighter and uh so they said, no, it's cool. And I went there and they got this whole room and the judge says, you know, the stuff. And there's some people had officers there and they contested and fought. And, and then they said, the rest of you are here pleading guilty with an explanation. That, that has to be the case. Da, da, da. You signed a waiver. Said, yeah, we'll go call your name up when you come up. Plead how you plead and share your explanation. So he calls me up. And I go up there. I didn't like it. I, I was like, eh. So I go up there and he says, Daniel Muller? I said, yes, sir. He said, how would you plead? I said, uh, I'm guilty, sir, with an explanation. He said, I'm listening. And, and I got a judge sitting there, man. This is a judge. He's a judge. He's got his little, we all stood. Duke, 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 all rise. That's why I had you rise. That's why you're still standing. I might have you here for a while. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll be late for my 1230. I will be. I'll just vanish. Now watch this. This is, this is powerful because I had the most Holy Ghost moment. It was incredible. So I said, well, sir, I said, I said, you know, and I tried to explain the new truck and the speed zone and I wasn't aware. And I said, sir, the bottom line is I'm not a 49 and a 30. I made a mistake. I didn't realize I was going 49 in that truck. If I'd ever known and realized I was in a 30, I wouldn't have been going. Now maybe 39 because I'm getting used to the truck. Not a 49 and 30. He said, how's your driving record? I said, sir, I don't have a thing on my record. He didn't even let me finish. He said, the court rules probation before judgment. Next. And I said, excuse me, your honor. 
And he said, yes. I said, I don't understand legal terms. Forgive my ignorance, but I don't know what that really means in the courts. He says, it means that uh, there's no judgment. Uh, you're vindicated in this thing. You're, you're, not, you're acquitted. Uh, and I said, you mean like it won't show up on my driver record, my insurance? He said, sir, he looked right at me. He said, sir, none of that. It'll be as if you've never done it. <laughs> now, that wasn't by accident because you've heard me preach that phrase over. Who's ever heard me preach that phrase over and over? Now, guess what was happening in that day in that court? God the Father was talking to me. And nailing some things down through a real experience. When that judge said that, you have no idea it's happening to me now a little bit. But the Spirit of God came over me in such a tangible way, I became like a buzzsaw. And I'm standing there, and he said, it'll be as if you've never done it. It was like I was standing before the Lord. And he was speaking over my life. And I went, yes, Your Honor. God bless you and thank you. Thank you. And I turned to get my little paper that said probation before judgment. I was like, Whoa. I was just, Whoa. and I got out there and I was overwhelmed. Why? Why? Because I did go 49 into 30. And mercy, the mercy of the court. Because I said I came here seeking mercy from the court, sir. And, and I shared my thing. And, and mercy triumphed over judgment. And out of the judge's mouth, he said, Dan, it's as if you've never done it. That's exactly what the gospel says to you. It's as if you've never done it. The thing you tempt to regret. The thing you wish you could change. The thing you wish you never did. The courts of heaven say, it's as if you've never done it. The fact that you're sorry and wish you didn't means you didn't. Because you're not the same person that did. So I get my paper, I get in line, and, and all he did was charge me. He took away the fine and everything and just charged me some little closing costs for the state of Maryland to cover the court thing. It was just a little minuscule amount compared to what it was. And I was like, hey, that's cool. I cost him time in that. I'll reimburse that. And I get in line, and the lady in front of me turned around and said, I was so nervous. How oh, I don't do good with this stuff. And oh my goodness, I was leaving the room, and I heard you ask him what, what your ruling meant because he said the same thing to me. And I didn't know what it meant, and I was too afraid to stand and listen, I thought I needed to get out of the room, so I missed it. What's probation before judgment mean? <laughs> so then I had to tell her and preach the gospel and tell her about God's love and the blood of Jesus and how powerful this all is today. And everybody in line and around you is listening because they're all there. <laughs> Lift our hands and thank Him right now for a message this good. I'm saying this. I believe by the Spirit of God. Guys, it's as if we've never done it. As long as our hearts are sincere, all He asks is repentance. That we wish different. We wish we'd have done different. Regret would eat us alive. You could never pay the debt. You could never go back and make it right once it's done. But you can change on the inside and you can say, Wow, I wish I'd have done different. And God says, Bingo, done. You've just changed. So, Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that it's getting in us, transforming us, and becoming who we are. And from this place, we will live our life and bear fruit unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. See you tomorrow. I'm out of here. Don't get in my way. I'll run you over. (laughs) Bless you all. (laughs) Yeah, and then we'll talk about it tomorrow.